Mrs. Colon? Here. Mrs. Flanders? Here. Mrs. Lyons? Here. Mrs. Miller? Here. Mr. Ruiz? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, adoption of the agenda. Do I have a motion? Lyons? A second, Miller. Miller? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Mason, do you do the pledge for us? Public, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with Moving on to report for closed session. In our closed session tonight, the board appointed Julie St. Cyr to the position of Public Media Relations Specialist, effective April 1st, 2021, pending her pre-employment clearance. The vote was five to zero, all board members voting yes. And that's all we have out of closed session. Superintendent's report, Dr. Mason, back to you. Thank you. Um, tonight we uh, have got um, something that is a, a real treat that we're gonna be able to share with you. We have our ROP video production class at Brailwinda High School participated in um, a directing change project um, video production um, contest for lack of a better word. Um, that is um, generated some three groups of students um, from from Braylinda High School produced videos that we're going to be watching here for just a second in just a second. And one of the videos, um, the one that is featuring um, a Vietnamese student who uh, tells the story of just kind of the cultural um, uh, kind of take on mental health issues the the focus is on suicide prevention and, and mental health awareness and um, they are so well done. And uh, board member, uh, board trustee Gail Lyons shared with me last night, they shared them at uh, ROP. She sits on their board, shared them this morning and just said, you know, hey, is there any way that uh, we can potentially show these tonight? And there's no way we're not going to. They're, uh, they're phenomenal. And I'm going to uh, um, turn this over to uh, Annette and she is going to uh, play them for us. They're all about one minute. There is a Vietnamese saying that goes, Hai a chong chong mai biet chong karang. In the literal sense, it means whoever sleeps in the blanket knows it has lice. It is a bit silly, but in a metaphorical sense, it means it is wrong to assume things about people because you don't know what they could be going through. The blanket being their barrier and the lice being their pain. Mental health issues in the Vietnamese community is heavily frowned upon. The Vietnamese youth is discouraged from sharing any thoughts about mental illness as it is a sign of weakness. The fear of appearing weak to your family members stops those who need help to reach out. And for those who do, they are met with nothing but trivialization about their mental angst. It is time to spread awareness about mental health and focus on the part that makes us human. Together we can air out the lice that live in our blankets. Together, we can get rid of the stigma of mental health in the Vietnamese community and other cultures as well. If you or a loved one is in need of help, reach out to a friend, family, healthcare professional, or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. I would have said something, but I didn't know what to say. I would have said something, but I was afraid I'd say the wrong thing and make it worse. I would have said something, but I was sure someone else would. I would have said something, but I was afraid I might have embarrassed him. I would have said something, but we really weren't that close. I would have said something, but I just didn't have the courage to. I would have said something, but I didn't want to assume. I would have said something, but I thought I had more time.
distance learning due to COVID-19 lockdowns has had a devastating effect on our mental health. Our grades and test scores are plummeting at an alarming rate. We've lost contact with our friends and don't communicate like we used to. We can't go out and enjoy the activities we love. It's hard to get motivated to do much of anything. Our passion has been replaced with apathy. Stress is weighing us down. We're being isolated from our friends. Depression is crushing our spirits. But remember, we're not alone. Help is available. You don't need to suffer in silence. Talk to a friend or family member, a counselor, or your healthcare professional. Visit eachmindmatters.org for more information. And uh, thank you again to uh, uh, Gail for sharing those and um, just three, the videos were just incredibly powerful and just knowing the things that are uh, and challenges that our students and, and really the community um, is facing just with the pandemic and so forth, just uh, being able to share those through uh, um, three poignant videos, I just thought would a, a great opportunity to uh, to just share tonight for, for those watching at home as, as well as the board. So incredibly talented students and, and very compelling storytelling. Again, as you can probably put together the, uh, the directing change program film contest, the goals are to promote awareness and education about mental health in creative ways, change and normalize conversations about mental health in school communities to increase help seeking behaviors, to advocate for a shift in mindset through the use of film to support dramatizing mental health, inspire a new generation to better understand the warning signs of suicide, how to get help for themselves, or for a friend when concerned, and to promote school and community resources that support suicide prevention and mental health services. So just uh, kudos to those students. And then the one that was the mental um, blanket, the first one we watched that was talked about mental health within the Vietnamese culture is going on to regional competitions. So we wish them the best of luck and um, we will uh, we'll find ways to, to use that public service announcement messages is really what they were producing. So um, I put that up against anything you see on television. So uh, incredibly powerful. So thank you again for uh, allowing us to, to share that with you. Um, moving on to uh, a different topic <clears throat> and um, CASP testing began at the high school. And we got a report during, uh, during closed session from uh, Assistant Superintendent Kerry Torres that uh, the reports coming out of Brayland High School is 77% of our junior and senior class that were uh, um, open or uh, able to test um, showed up in person. We've been uh, um, struggling since coming back with uh, um, keeping our enrollment and in, in daily attendance up. Not that students aren't logging on, so our attendance rate appear to be healthy, but the in-person per, in rates um, were, were not where they were prior to us um, moving back to distance learning. It was just great and heard that from so many different people, parent comments, staff, student, administrative comments, just it was great seeing students on campus. So CASP testing is underway and it would be lovely if that somehow also so just kind of spawned a, um, a desire to continue to have more kids on campus as we uh, as we finish out this school year. On the topic of a school update, Carrie Torres and I will be um, giving a, a more comprehensive update on uh, on status of schools later on during information direction and discussion. <clears throat> um, since we've also uh, returned, um, we have hired six resident subs, one each at each of our elementary schools, um, getting qualified substitutes that were trained in the, the platform, um, Zooming and, and, and being able to use our, uh, our, our technology platforms. We found it, that it was just beneficial to um, hire one per site and um, have them ready to go on a daily basis. Uh, if there happens to be a day that a substitute is not needed, then they are working with site administration for enrichment and uh, support for uh, students needing extra um, extra instructional support and in either whether that be reading mathematics or um, it's it's tailored individually for uh, for each elementary campus. Um, also um, excited to announce again we had to uh, 
forego it last year based on COVID, the Brea Education Foundation, um, one of their, their key fundraisers every year is the annual golf tournament, and it is scheduled this year for Monday, June 14th. Registration begins at... Um, 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 on May, uh, sorry, on March 15th. And if you sign up and uh, pay prior to May 21st, you get in for the bargain basement price of $150 per player. And what a great way to kind of shake off the cobwebs of doing things socially and, and get signed up. So uh, get your foursomes together. They take the money that they raise and they pour it directly back into our school programs. Um, and so I would just highly encourage people to participate. The uh, golf tournament this year will be at Black Gold. And so uh, a great golf course. And, um, and then the last thing I would like to share with you is a, uh, a letter that was shared for me highlighting one of our teachers. It's, it's really kind of a commendation or a thank you, uh, thank you note to uh, Todd Seleski, um, teacher of the Gita program. Um, Global Information Technology Academy at the high school and recognize some students. And so it's from Linda Shea, Executive Director and Curator of the Bray Historical Society and Museum. I'm writing to thank you for the Gita program at our high school and to share my experience working with Mr. Seleski and the students from this program. We began working with Mr. Seleski in 2017 when his student, Remy Wadeen, produced an um, American with Disability Ask compliance video for the museum. The video can be found on our website. In 2019, her student, his student, Johan Dizan, uh, developed self-guided tours of Brea's art in public places using Google Maps and Google Earth. Access to those programs is also on our website. This year, we are working with two students, Neil Azimi and Emily Parks, on website improvements and an interactive map on our patio tiles. Uh, most recently, his former student, Kaya, helped us recover data from the crashed hard drive, and that's what she was most thankful for, that what they would saved over time. Um, I think it also may be motivated to have a backup drive, but um, that doesn't do any good when it's crashed. And so um, called them in a panic, just hoping that they could help, and they did. As a museum director, I frequently work with volunteers, but the students from the Gita program are much more than volunteers. They're project partners. Of course, each is, is a technology wizard, but more importantly, they are reliable, courteous, self-managing, and extremely talented, completing projects that bring value to our visitors and to the community at large. Based on my experience working with Mr. Seleski, it's not difficult to see that he develops um, helps develop these qualities in his students as evidenced by his own demeanor. Mr. Seleski, the students in his class and the program he oversees are an asset to the community. I'm very grateful for the help that I, um, and I thank you for making this program possible. Cordially, Linda Shea, Executive Director and Curator. And um, I walked a copy to Mr. Seleski. He had received it from her, just wanted to make sure that he was aware of the high esteem that, that um, he and his program was held at the, the Bray Historical Society. And so um, because we were um, honoring and, and recognizing students on video, just more talented students in the Gita program. So um, uh, just so many good things going on at Braylinda High School. And I uh, just wanted to share that with you and just kind of read it into the record for uh, the public to hear. So that's, uh, that's my update for this evening. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lyons, can we use those videos at all? Are we allowed to, or is there a time? Okay. I was wondering if it would be a good idea for us to ask the city to post it on their channel three. It'd be kind of a good connection, the city and the uh, school district working together on that because it affects everybody, not just school kids. Thank you. Number six, recognition, School Library Month, April 2021. Mr. Mason, what are we doing? Yeah, just um, in the past, um, the, in we have had different resolutions that are already things that are recognized by the state and nationally, but just wanted to take this opportunity. It's on our calendar in the, in the back of our agenda, but just... Um, a special thanks to um, our library media techs and our librarians. There's there's never been a time where they have been um, busier supporting students, both in person and remotely. And as we had to pivot and transition to 
um, to distance learning. Um, they were very instrumental in the, the gathering of, of instructional materials for students. They were instrumental in helping to deploy the technology and Chromebooks that needed to be uh, given out to our students. Um, the, in the other duties as assigned, it's not their typical, um, you know, probably the last year, but um, they have really stepped up and just wanted to uh, take an opportunity to just appreciate the work that they do in supporting our students. Still got the library, still got all the books, still got all those wonderful things, but um, it's so much more than just keeping our um you know, libraries operating in hushed tones and books checked out in this environment, we could not have done the work that we've done without them. And so just wanted to uh, just kind of call out and especially recognize them this evening. Thank you. Bring correspondence, none. Presentations, second interim budget update, Mr. Champion. 36 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> After watching this, uh, we should start introducing them every video time. There. Ladies and gentlemen, Derek. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, board. Uh, trustees, those that are watching on uh, YouTube tonight. Um, myself, along with Christina Michelle, our Director of um, Fiscal Services. My name is Rick Champion, an Assistant Superintendent of Business Services. As required, we'll be presenting and updating the board and um, the public on our second interim report going forward. Um, just a couple of little, uh, as we go through this, a little timeline, a little uh, certification process. What are we doing here as the part of this process? The impact from COVID on our fiscal side. We call it the three C's that made up the budget that we're at our second point now looking, looking at it. The report itself, the multi-year projection report, which is our basically our checkbook or our grade book of where we're headed and then some next steps. Good evening. Yes. So as he mentioned, you've previously adopted our budget for a current fiscal year. And back in December, you approved our first interim report uh, that reflected budgets up until October 31st. Then currently this evening, we will be presenting to you our second interim report, which provides all updates to the budget from July to January 31st. And finally, in September, we'll provide you with a UA an, an audited actuals end of year report, which summarizes our fiscal year and all of our true actuals reflected up until June 30th, 2021. So as Rick stated per ed code, we have uh, ed code 42300 requires California school districts to pre present the district's financial position twice a year. These are referred to our interim reports. And this evening, once again, um, we present second interim up until January 31st. And the objectives basically are to provide a review of our financial condition, provide the necessary updates to the budget to reflect uh, the current and projected financial information provided to us. And finally, to provide that status report to the Board of Education and the public of our financial position. In addition to these interim reports, we also provide you with multi-year projection report. These reports examine the position of the district of critical components, such as enrollment, our spending patterns, our ending fund balance, our reserve for economic uncertainties for our current and two out years. This multi-year projection leads us to self-certify. So there are three different certifications we can provide for ourselves. Simply are positive, qualified, or negative. So our positive generally states that we will be able to meet current year obligations and our two subsequent out years. Our qualified means that we may not meet those obligations. 
And our negative, which no district ever wants to be, is that we will not be able to meet our current year and our two out year financial obligations. That was the best part of the presentation that you got me. <laughs> <laughs> so before we end up knowing where we're going, kind of look back of where we were and how we prepared this budget. So when we started this process, as Christina said, it was really during the midst of the worst economic and health crisis when we prepared back in May and June. So if you recall, some of these slides will look repetitive from our first interim and from the budget too, but California was in bad shape or projected to be in bad shape. And as you recall, as you look at the arrow, education funding sits a pretty good chunk of that $54 billion problem that the state was facing. And how are they going to close that gap? Because the state has to close and produce a balanced budget. So a lot of it has changed now. Just as we got into this year, um, their projections were a little bit too conservative. And the, if you recall, it was really based on the 2019 year when there was not a pandemic. pandemic. So the revenues are coming in at a more robust um, rate than they actually projected. So as we go through, just keeping the volatility of our budget, which us folks in the accounting and fiscal side hate. We like certainty because it produces good assumptions, which produces a good budget. But as we know, as soon as we present the budget, it's obsolete. But just kind of gets you down to this year's budget was based on the three C's, okay? COLA, not the type you drink, but the cost of living allowance, the CARES Act, which was a federal stimulus, which provided a lot of sugar to the environment, I mean, to the economic environment, and in and, and cash flow, because we'll talk about that in a sec, how they balance their budget. COLA, this is what we see as our steady bellwether in, in districts that 90% um, of us that re rely on the state for funding is a nice steady increase every year. I thought that was chatter, sorry. And as you can see, back in January, when we we're preparing this year's budget a year ago, plus a couple months, the state was projecting a downturn in COLA and we were panicking because how are you gonna pay for PERS and STRS? How are we gonna adjust for operating costs? But as you know, it was adjustable. Five months later, as we prepared our budget, the economic, there we go. As we prepared our budget, the state now was projecting the doom and gloom as I was showing you. They were talking about 10% cuts to our base budget, okay? And then in the out years, which we have to certify a 0% cost of living. That's what we based our budget going into June, okay? Districts that did not have the reserves were panicking because if you don't have the reserves, we'll show a little bit later, other people will make decisions for you. If you have reserves, you get to make the decision. You have the time. But we were fiscally responsible, and we'll talk about that as we go forward. Come June, I don't know what's wrong here, Derek. Okay, come another 30 days later, the governor and the state made a deal. We'll not do 10% cuts. We'll do 0% COLA and in the out years, which basically means your funding is flat. But we're going to not pay you this year's money until some point in the future. So they double the deferrals, which is the, in the fiscal world, that's the D word. That's the bad word. In other words, you're, you're going to operate today. We'll give you an IOU or an accounts receivable for those that are in private businesses and we'll pay you sometime in the future. And we're expecting 100% PPA back in the out year. So that was, um, I'm having extreme trouble here. Now, if you look at the red now, this is the governor now saying for next year, these are proposed, but I thought I'd bring this up and show, this is not today's money. This is next year's, but it does have a factor in the reporting for our multi-year projection. Still this year is flat funding. Still this year is zero is deferrals. They still happened in February. We're now getting less money than we were supposed to. The IOUs are still mounting up. But next year, the governor is proposing, and most economic analysts concur that we will see a 3.84% COLA, which is nice because it adds ongoing revenue. And then after that, 
the state will start seeing structural deficits. So they're projecting a less cola in the out year. So just kind of show you this roller coaster of cola in really an 18 month period. Again, accounting people, we hate that. We like consistency. But just to show you what the chatter is. Now this is proposed. Again, May's coming up as we looked at last year, which was so dramatic. So I thought we'd just look at that. The, th the second C, the CARES Act. Um, this is where the uh, Fed stepped up, state stepped up primarily and injected a lot of dollars into the economy. And District uh, Brea was also a recipient of $3.7 million, as you see there, and the state $100,000. Now, these were dollars that were to be spent specifically and restricted on a specific pur purpose, right? PPE, learning loss mitigation, get more teachers, more support, which we did. We did spend those dollars on the intent of the law. It was, it was a little bit loose on what you could spend it for, but we really spent it. The, the caveat or the hard thing is, is we had a certain time frame to spend it, a really compressed time. We reported to the state, we've certified all our things and we've included that in our budget and we've spent that. Kind of show you just a pie chart. If you look at the blue, red and orange or the 9%, the 16% and the 48%, that represents where we addressed, not my words, but learning loss, teacher support services, the online academy, those really were those dollars where we pumped those dollars into the, our economy. Because remember, we were expecting a 2.8% COLA and we got zero. And now we're getting 33, uh, 60 cents on the dollar for, for going forward in our main source of income. And then the third C is cash. This is a D word. This is where, well, uh, if you operate today, I'll pay tomorrow. Thing. The blue line represent how our cash normally comes in. As you see, a district of our in our caliber, we received most of it at the beginning of the fiscal year. We received no dollars in November and December and in the out years, the out months in this year. The red actually reflects the cash that we're gonna receive. So you can kind of see the mismanagement or disparity of the ins and the outs. But just to give you an idea, but really what does defers mean? You know, the state gets to pass a budget without paying interest and they get credit for balancing their budget, right? Districts will need to access cash, either you borrow internally which we have the option from yourself. In other words, if you have higher reserves, you have other sub funds, or you got on the open market and you sell what they call a trans, which is basically you're selling a future cash stream in today at a bank and you're paying interest on it. And then when the state pays it back, they get credit for it too, because they're basically, it's like getting a raise, but you're not getting the raise today, but we'll pay you back in the future. So trying to just give you an idea. So when we prepared this year's budget, we. With, we actually operate on a number of assumptions. Um, suspended COLA, ADA harmless. And what that means, ADA is average daily attendance. It's not enrollment, but it is the attendance that comes in. And the state recognized that obviously there is no attendance because we're either in a virtual learning or in a hybrid, that they held our attendance rate based on the 1920 year back in February when things were starting to shut down. And they've continued to do so for this fiscal year. Um, the impact of losing our, our supplemental funding um, was not held harmless. And those that data point comes from our free and reduced section of our district, the free lunch, lunches. And that actually tra translates into how much more money you get on top of your base grant. Um, and since we're not, we're just feeding anyone zero to 18, the application, there is no application process. So the count now is actually going down. This is a district, this is a California problem. This is not a Brea problem, but we're actually get, receiving less supplemental or projected to receive less supplemental now each year because it's a three-year rolling gross and it moves down. A lot of stuff in the weeds, but our federal revenue, we projected to be um, steady lottery, no flat, people are still buying their scratchers. And so those monies have not been drastically restored. And then they actually restored the categorical problems and, uh, programs. What's happening in our sub accounts, which we'll look, look at later is our food service and our childcare and our bus transportation. We received a lot of those dollars in our revenue from paid parent contributions. In other words, programs. Um, food service, there is no paid parent this year 
because everything is now reimbursed by the state, by the USDA, and um, childcare. That's been an issue because of the cohort guidelines that you, and um, the cost of operating that program. And people are at home, parents are at home. Why would they need child clear, right? Facility rentals, no one's renting our facilities. So we wrote all those dollars off of our projections. And really, as we know, um, our booster and our impact on that because that was a, uh, contributed to some of our funds. So second interim is now as Christmas Michelle, talked about, this is looking at July 31st, uh, excuse me, January 31st of this year from July. So our total revenue expected from all sources, 72 million. We're now expected to sp spend 73 million out the door, which we've closed that gap because we recall in the first interim, we were looking at a 1.9% deficit. Now we've closed that gap in a number of things, but mainly just unfilled positions through January, contracts that we budgeted for, that we'd got spending dollars on it, we've closed those, but we still kept them up obviously in the budget from February 1st to the end of this fiscal year. But we get this, we, we have these interim reports to start rebalancing our budget as we move forward. But as you see there, 75% of our income um, relies so much on the state of California. And of course, when you throw on colas and not spending, uh, having deferrals, it adds up. Our expenditures kind of look like that in the pie chart. Uh, 40, these are your percentage of salaries here and benefits, but just kind of give you an idea. We have a structural deficit as you look at this year. Um, it's expected, sometimes structural deficits are planned as we'll look in our out years as we spend money. But just kind of give you an overall idea of where we're at. Um, the out years, again, assumptions based on the information we have today. And it changes because just today, Governor, President Biden signed a new third tranche stimulus bill that's going to affect our budget going forward for the out years. But anyways, here's some of the assumptions. We probably would assume we're still going to have an online or an independence program next year. Um, we know we're going to have additional learning loss mitigation supports. Our step and calm, we use a 2% health and welfare. We've increased that a little bit because we have a, we already heard from some of our carriers that health insurance might start seeing an upward tick. Wonder why. Pensions of the leveling off are gonna spike in the third year because the PERS and STRS problem did not go away. The state just injected capital to rate, reduce the employer's contribution. And just really just the spending and all the other requirements that are thrown upon school districts and some that I call unfunded, unfunded mandates and new leave laws, these are things that we don't know that just seem to show up um, and there's no reimbursement from the state or the federal, but we have to inject costs on those. So we have some, through some of the assumptions in there. And as you kind of look, here's a graph of our assumptions. Really, if you look in our third year, this stirs and purrs is gonna have a, a big uh, adjustment on our district as we move forward. We've left our funded ADA, as I, if you recall, we get paid upon average daily attendance, we left that flat to be very conservative because districts in California, if they reduce or have a lower enrollment than the prior year, you get funded on the higher of the two. So even if the, our district experienced a declining enrollment next year, not projected, but if we did, we our funding would still remain the same because you get the higher of the two years. So. A lot of districts in California have, were experiencing declining enrollment. We weren't just this year, but a lot of districts are gonna start seeing some issues in that 22, 23 year because they'll start dropping off if, quickly and they call it the cliff. And we'll talk about that at budget adoption. And just to be conservative too, uh, the, we were going with the uh, UCLA and not the governor's COLA, just to make sure that we stay there. Again, just to kind of look at the difference between the first and second interim, um, this is in your packet, this is online, but kind of show each the, the difference of the different cost sectors that are different in the um, variance. What does that really mean at the end of the day? If you look in this center column, second interim, this is what's called the ending fund balance as of 22, 21, this fiscal year as projected January 31st. Okay, 
um, you have certain subcategories. It says that we're going to, we should have projected to end this year at $16.2 million, uh, a slight increase of almost $942,000 from the first interim. But that doesn't mean that's what we have in the, in the bank, okay? Because some of these dollars are not expendable. So in other words, if you look at the $1.5 million, that is restricted money. Those are monies that have to be spent on that program. Okay. As you go, those are kind of our subcategories of there. Now, when the sky was falling back and we prepared this budget, we were planning for textbook adoption. We were planning for other uses of our one-time dollars from prior years. We were saving up money to expend it. Perfectly sound financial advice. So we basically put everything on hold because obviously if you take a 10% haircut, it's going to hurt and you need to have those funds to keep you going. But now we've kind of thought, you know what, based on where we're going and what the state's saying and some new one-time dollars coming in from the state, we're going to now really rethink those dollars and put them back out of just the unassigned category. So if you look at this 5.8, and I'm going to have Assistant Superintendent Carrie Torres talk about our science curriculum right there, but we've kind of now put that back, back on the radar because we know we're coming back. This is where you start investing yourself in a down, when a business is down or down economy, you start investing in yourself. So if the 5.8, we're not gonna say that's really not a, unassigned anymore and used for growth. We have a pretty good handle, I think we're, where we're going. So as you see, we're gonna 2.4, we call it prior one-time funds. Those are funds that are still available to invest in our district one time, okay, in assets. And then we brought back, which we, which Ms. Torres will talk about here in a sec. This is kind of a joint presentation. So Paul, yes, it's gonna go a little bit more than your projection of time. But 1.7 is what the board had proved back um, earlier last year. And then a number of other things. So Carrie. 30 seconds on um, our textbook adoption. But yeah, this Board of Education approved um, a one-time purchase last March. If you can believe we were here together a year ago and we had done an NGSS pilot in our K-12 program, super proud of the work that we did. And the board did approve the purchase of $1.7 million uh, of the McGraw-Hill K-8 program and the HMH uh, set, uh, 9 through 12 program um, for NGSS. And we, um, as Mr. Champion has said, we had sunsetted that temporarily until we could afford to purchase. Um, and now that we're in a better financial standing, we are ready to re- um, we uh, look at that and go ahead and move forward with our NGSS rollout for the 2021 school, 2021, 22 school year. Um, and we are moving forward with our uh, K-8 McGraw-Hill purchase, which is just about 1.5. And then our high school one is just about 200,000. So um, those numbers are very stable from last year in terms of the publishers. And so if there are any changes or variations, we'll be bringing that back later, but super excited to be able to use um, these dollars to be able to purchase um, to purchase those textbooks as we move forward into the future, going back to normal. <laughs> yeah, and then just the other funds that were really related to you know lottery and then of the insurance rebates that we've gotten over the years that are we want to use those for safety issues and stuff and a couple other little grants. Um, you know, we just have a rock star for fiscal manager. And you know what, I'm going to keep you in suspense until we report <laughs> our estimated actuals. But I think if I was to scratch the side of my head, I would say yes. But anyway, the other thing too, that was an assigned to is what we call our supplemental grant funds from prior years that districts um, are supposed to spend on the students that generate those funds, right? We call them our unduplicated account. I hate that word, unduplicated, but just basically means they fit into one of three categories and you can't, if they fit into all three categories, you can't count them three times. So they use this word unduplicated count, but $1.2 million in what we call our LCAP, which is basically instructional materials that we do now have now pulled out and we plan to spend those, Ms. Taurus is just so happy to spend those on the, the needs that generated the students that generated those dollars. And we have that in our plan and we'll show you moving forward. And that really leaves about 5.3 projected, what I call unassigned. And usually you keep those unassigned dollars for one-time use emergencies. Let's just call it the COLA is volatile. Hmm. 
I wonder when that happens, right? Unfunded liabilities, deficit spending, which we'll have as, as you'll see here in a sec. And this is really to hedge against disruptions of revenue. And I guess that never happens in school districts where you have disruption of revenue, but it did happen this, this year. Um, and of course, we have to keep by law 3% of our expenditures as a required reserve. Again, that's two weeks of payroll, so not a lot. But just to show you, that $16.2 million, that's not, we can just go write a check for that, okay? There are specific use, specific requirements, and then plans to spend and invest in the district. Again, whatever we do, these are just one-time dollars in our savings account. Um, this is a very busy slide, but I just wanted to show you that we have spent those dollars and we do still plan to, because of the 0% COLA, still will have a structural deficit going forward in the out years of 5.6 and 4.4. And I'll show you here in a sec how we're gonna afford this. But this does not exclude, this does not include any of the new dollars and we'll recap that here in a sec. Um, again, the balance sheet, the ending fund balance, we just looked at two slides ago, but now we're looking at the out years. So as you can recall, here was, if, it, if you can see my little red circle, here's where we were just talking about our textbook, our NGSS, our LCAP dollars. We're gonna start spending those down out of reserve. So they're coming out, the deficit is really accelerated a little bit on paper because we're spending from savings account. And it's just, it becomes an expenditure just in government accounting. But at the end of the day, can we meet, re, can we meet our 3% reserve? And as you can see, we can. And as you recall, Director Michelle was talking about the positive, qualified, and negative. And obviously, you know where I'm headed towards on that since we say net, net, net. Kind of just wanted to show you, because 3.8% COLA is pretty, looks pretty good on paper, right? But when you really start looking at it, it really, it would flat funding, and if we kept our enrollment the same, and if we didn't increase, and it would probably bring in about 1.9, I say probably because I'm, it's an estimation, about 1.9 in new money. But we know we have some demands on that cash that are not, that will increase, PERS and STRS, health and welfare, step and column, um, our other sub accounts or restricted programs like special ed, which is, operates outside of the general fund unrestricted. So we will still have positive number coming from new source, but when you operate on a less than 2% COLA, and this is just my rule, this is not a, this is a rule of thumb. We, you know, districts can't operate on less than 2%, you know, just by looking at the cost. So, and who knows what the new cost unfunded mandate costs, but just kind of wanted to point that picture out that yes, next year's dollars, 3.8, it's, it's great. It's a great conversation to start. Again, we need to get into May and then actually the end of the budget. So um, we usually just kind of go real fast with the sub accounts, but I kind of want to draw your attention to the two top funds, which is child care fund and the cafeteria fund. And these funds um, have really had a, a pretty good erosion of their, their ending fund balance. And obviously child care has taken just a beating in our ending fund balance because it was a, really a district choice of keeping child care open. We know we needed to do it for essential workers. We had staff that was depending on it. When you go from, um, I can't recall the ratios, but 18 to one down to 12 to, to 10 to one, you know, you just have more costs. And of course, if you don't have the revenue, except for coming from a little bit from the state um, preschool dollars, we've seen an incredible erosion of our projected ending fund balance. So we know we need to address some of our new one-time dollars coming up to really replenish this fund, okay? Typically, it should be um, probably probably be more comfortable if it was uh, three times that in the 300,000, so, but it is what it is, right? Cafeteria fund, general, we've been contributing anywhere between two and $300,000 a year from the general funds, just been the way we've been operating businesses. Um, it's now 1.3 million contribution projected for this year because obviously there is no paid parent contribution for our, our meals, right? Even, even though we offer it for free, we're out there with signs and we've been now two sites delivery. We're doing everything we can to raise that revenue, but the costs have gone up constant. And as you recall, we could not make any adjustment in this year's budget 
due to the governor's enacted budget on custodial food service and transportation workers. So it's just some of the funds that I usually don't, we usually just on to the next slide on this, but I just want to draw your attention. We're watching those. They are going to be part of our conversation when we prepare our budget moving forward. Um, and then just our capital facility fund, which is our developer fees. Um, they're still building in Brea, thank, thank goodness. So they're building pretty good in Brea, thank goodness. And we'll be utilizing some of the, these funds as required because we don't want to give them back and it's used for growth. And there's a couple of agenda items tonight to use some of those funds that are appropriate for this fund. And then of course, our main uh, fund 40, which is a capital facility fund. And these are, these are as of July, as January 31st. Um, almost done. What's on the horizon? More COVID relief dollars. None of it though is included in our budget yet <laughs> because they're just getting ragged up. They're just writing policy. They're just writing forms. We know Ms. Torres is gonna be so happy because she's gonna have to do, do no, a fourth LCAP presentation um, next in May. Um, another, yes, another plan, but just kind of want to show you what is it for Brea? You know, we, obviously a lot of it's based on federal support, which is based on Title I dollars. And here in Brea, we um, are the third or fourth lowest Title I calculation. So we're not gonna get a lot of dollars, but thank you, we are gonna get some dollars. We expect about 1.3 million, these are school services of California estimates coming from what we just call ESSER II. This is the one back that President Trump signed Yes, on my birthday, I love to say that. I said that at the table with our bargaining folks, but uh, 1.3 million, it's not included in our budget yet. The American Rescue Plan signed today by President Biden estimated for Brea about $2.8 million. I have zero details on the use. I assume they're gonna be just like the federal stimulus that we received. Um, the state, now Governor Newsom, have you heard, he just made a deal with the legislature safe schools all for grant, that's to get the schools back open, which we as a, as a district did do it on time. They just didn't approve the money. But now we're in line for that. About $1.8 million coming there, it's not included in our budget. And of course, the what they call the Expanded Learning Time and Academic Intervention Grant. I'm sure there's gonna be an acronym for that one too. About $3.8 million coming to Brea's way. Um, the good news is, it's coming. It'll be next year's budget, but they're talking about letting us spend the money or injecting the money starting in next month, right? To Because obviously a lot of it is for learning loss, summer school, whatever that means and whatever it looks like, but we know we need districts need capital to have those programs get going. Um, we don't want to have another IOU. The governor's also talking about paying back two thirds of the deferrals, which is nice too, but again, projected. Um, the bad news is, I'm not looking a gift horse in the mouth, but we need to expend these funds probably <laughs> by August of 2022. Doesn't allow continuing programs to go because as you've, you've all heard me say, never spend one-time revenue on one-time, always spend one-time revenue on one-time dollars, never on ongoing. And um, so President, uh, Super, Assistant Superintendent Torres, she's so happy that she gets the Spend, spend, spend. Usually the business department says no, no, no. Um, but um, anyway, so she'll be presenting that in May. Okay. All right, friends. So let's wrap this up with our next steps. We have a staff and executive cabinet that will sit in on the governor's May revision. And he will provide us with the um, fundamental assumptions we'll use for our future budget. And here in June, we'll be presenting to you the 2021 estimated actual report, which is how we anticipate the fiscal year to terminate, along with the 21-22 budget. And in September, we'll roll around with our unaudited actuals, which will certify how we finalize the year. And all throughout, we'll be working with our auditors uh, as they audit our fiscal year 2021 records. And that will be presented on December 21st. And I just wanted to take a brief moment to um, thank all staff for assisting with this budget presentation. Um, Christy Hopkins, who's my partner and, and is my right-hand person and, pre and putting this budget together along with the ladies in the fiscal services office that have displayed 
exponential growth in these past few months. It's been super exciting to see them learn and grow and just thrive off of learning so much about budget. And it's boring as heck, but we make it so fun. So <laughs> it's just, it's a, it's a really great environment and I'm excited to be a part of it. Thank you. And she's being modest too. We also change our software and, you know, why not during a pandemic? We, we, we might as well do that. And so um, this district is very lucky that we uh, stole her away from a district from the South. So board later tonight on agenda item, uh, we'll be recommending staff a positive certification and adoption of our budget um, going forward. So we look forward to any, we, we'd like look forward to entertaining any questions or comments from the board right now. And that concludes our presentation. Trustee Lyons. Yeah. Uh -oh. oh, and stay on there. Um, back, you don't need to go back to the slide, but the, I'll just show it to you. The slide with the, the one time money, uh -huh. one time uh, funds, and the big 48.6% was for addressing learning loss. My question was going to be, and then I think at the end here, you answered it. Um, sort of so what specifically did um we address with learning loss what are some of the uses for that money because i, I thought i thought you were going to say that was set aside for summer school but now we're using no this that school money yeah that slide um trustee flanders the 48.6 is that you're referring right. to the blue mm -hmm. feet that is dollars that we spent um really to i call it address learning loss but basically it's the teacher support the services for the classroom the online academy, the independent study. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the yeah. computers for home, because it needed them, the Wi-Fi, those, those that, kinds that of That is in all in the pie. Okay. That blue section is basically, let's just call it salaries. It was also support and redirection of current staff, our TOSAs, our tech services, of course. Thank you, mm -hmm. um, Derek Chain. <laughs> 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 Sorry, it's an inside joke. But anyway, so that's what it refers to is the the pit salaries. So okay. as you go through the other thing, there's also we spend a tremendous amount of money on dollars, PPE, disinfected, cleaning. So and the signs. new money that's that's being promised to us will go for summer school and the actual trying to I don't want to say catch up, but helping with the learning loss that has transpired. I can't wait directly until, to the students. Correct? Yeah, exactly. I can't wait until May when assistant superintendents presents her <laughs> report so but and yes that's the intent of the new dollars is really to address the same needs so because these are ongoing costs that are going to accumulate so and thank you for bringing christina that was awesome thank you great yep a couple of things when you talk about the child development fund obviously that's always just been we don't even ever, ever think about that in the past and yeah. so now with this kind of drop in in revenue yeah What's the outlook for that? What are you guys anticipating will happen in that arena? So Mr. Champion has the dollars and cents, but um, we are meeting with child development services because as you heard tonight, you know, we've just had to restructure the program. It has always been a healthy program. It's been growing in for the last eight years, constant growth, um, had a healthy ending fund balance every year until recently and, and we're not quite in the red, but we're getting there. So we are meeting with our director, um, Penny Andrews to go over the projections. Um, we have had a decline this year uh, simply because parents haven't had the need as everybody seems to be working from home. But as the world continues to reopen, she's seeing a small increase in participation. Uh, for example, spring break camp that we run every year, uh, we expected it to be low, but she already had 91 people signed up as of today when we spoke. So things are improving, but we will have to restructure the program because that is something that if we cannot maintain the enrollment that we've had in the past, um, that we would have to restructure. Uh, we are pleased to see that we have a waiting list for preschool. So preschool filled instantly, which is awesome, which is part of their program. Um, and so it's a wait and see, but it is something, um, Trustee Lyons, that we need to address if we don't have the numbers that we need to move forward. Um, however, we've also discussed with um, Rick's new pot of gold from these different, um, you know, federal and state programs, um, that this could be a bridge here to support some of those programs to uh, make contributions to the child development services program 
to keep it afloat in a, in a year where we know in 2022, 23, we would be back to normal. Bray has been a place where families have needed our childcare services. And so I know that that need will come back. And it'll depend on what model we have in the fall, obviously, to see where we need it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, cool pop-outs on your presentation. <laughs> can we get the slides in there as well so we can see them later on? Because you had some cool things in those little. Yeah. Did you not? They should Superman. Be. They don't show up in the one that's on here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So most, def most definitely, I'll share those. That with would be you. great. And then on uh, slide number twenty-two. It talks again about stirs and purrs and remind me, I know there's a spike in three, the third year out, uh -huh. but that swing for stirs from, uh -huh. you know, minus 57 to, you know, right. what talk to talk. Yeah. To it's a little over a 2% increase. So this year compared to 21, 22, it's almost a push. In other words, it went from 16% to 15.92%, about 16%. So the, the, investment that the state made a couple of years ago to buy down the employer's portion is now seen in an effect. They did that, I think a couple of years ago and, and last budget year. So there is no really increase in stirs between this year and next year, which as we know is a majority chunk of our certificated payroll is, is a, good, a good percentage of our overall payroll. The PERS, on the other hand, which is the Public Employees Retirement Program, which is the non-STRS, the classified okay. management, anyone that's not, is going to see a 3% increase over the next year. So 3% and then another 3% um, approximating. Okay. The out year and the third year for STRS goes from 15.92 to is it 18%. So that's a 2% increase. Doesn't sound like 2%, doesn't sound like a lot, but when you times it by 22 million or 23 million at that time, it's an incredible contribution. And it's been a problem, it's a systematic problem for all districts. This is not a Brea issue. This is a California retirement issue. I think it's gonna be a little bit higher in those out years because remember, Spurs and Stirs generates funds, not only from employer and employee contribution, but also investments in the stock market, even though it's been pretty good, but other investments in their sub funds from investment portfolio. So, um, and of course, I think that we're going to see a, a, a increase in retirements too, because just a, it was happening anyways pre-COVID. So I think we're going to have to address this problem as a state level, not a Brea issue, because we can't just go open up a 401k system or elect to not be participate in stirs. But yeah. um, but it's going to be an issue that's going to cause draining of monies from the classroom or from future COLA increases. Okay. So it's so definitely an issue. Then that comes back to something I've mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And um, are we going to look at a pension stabilization fund? Because there are districts out there that they're just now in their second year yeah. and they're getting five to 8% return right yeah. now on the, in these last two years, you know, yeah. and you put that against what we get at the County, which is a half of a percent. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, right. It, it just, we have some money that's, available right. it just seems like if we could set some you know if even it's just a targeted amount that we yeah. set aside it's starting to pay off for a lot of districts yeah. that you have a little bit of a cushion yeah it comes down to uses of money right just like anything you know we have uh, just a finite of resources that come in as we talked about the one-time dollars our cola um our planned investment in, into our own and new textbook adoptions we're going to look at facility investment again uh, soon. Um, it's an ongoing question. So they really come down to a decision. Do we put money away that goes into a trust fund? Of course, I didn't even talk about our OPEB dollars, which is our other po post-employment benefit program. But it just becomes down to a, de a decision on the limited resources that are coming in. So yes, I kind of see what you're saying. And I still um, we're still investigating that as we look forward, but the demands for new cash are starting to outstrip the supply of new cash. And um, there, then there's gonna have to be a yin and a yang or a give and a go on some of these decisions, even though some of them might look more attractive. It's just, that's something that we know is yeah. gonna be out years for us. I mean, those benefit costs are gonna to continue to go. Yeah. And if there's, we just need to, there's not too many vehicles that you can actually you know, there's very limited vehicles in public side. Yeah. We can invest. And yeah. so 
you know, I, again, I'm just, I'm throwing it out there, but I, I've mentioned it three times and I'm really, I really want us to consider it. So I think we should definitely we'll bring back more it. information as we get closer to the budget. Spending your money on textbooks adoption. How close is the state in actually getting away from physical textbooks and starting to go digital? Um, okay, so great question. Uh, digital textbooks have been around for just a couple of years. Um, and under the Williams Act, we have to purchase a textbook for every child in core content areas. So um, the answer to that is we can, in theory, now that we're one to one, if you think of the model we're in, in theory, we could buy digital textbooks, but they're no less expensive than buying an actual physical textbook. So the publishers have not said that you're going to get a discount if you only go online or digital. It's the same cost at this point in time. So in the future, I could imagine publishers would be shifting gears, but they have not done so yet. So right now, when we purchase this adoption, there's a large online component to these books, um, and especially for the teachers. And so we have um, currently benchmark advance in elementary school and our Go Math program. Those have digital elements to them. They're not fully digital for students, but they are for teachers. So in the future, that's a possibility. Um, and as we continue to experience the virtual setting, that is something that we could consider. So, but they're not when, quite cheaper yet. I wonder when Jeff Bezos is just going to open his own publishing company and take it away from him. He's retired now. <laughs> he, he's always thinking. It's but a good yeah. idea for you to go into business, Mr. Ruiz. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I have All a right. question. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. I have a question. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Dina. Uh, um, it's to Ms. Torres. Oh, good. <laughs> For um, the science textbook, textbook. Yes. Um, I know that was done over a year ago. Are you using the enrollment numbers from that time frame because that's what was approved, or are we downsizing at all because our numbers may be lower and anticipating people will be coming back? So what we do in this case is the board approved a purchase for the dollar amount based upon the enrollment um, in 20, what was that? Oh my gosh, 2020. Right. Um, and so what we'll do now is the board has already approved that. So I'll go back to the publishers and let them know I have X amount of first grade teachers. This is our current student enrollment. We won't reduce it significantly because we do anticipate those students returning. This is an eight year adoption. So we'll buy them. And if we have an extra few books here and there, we warehouse them right now at Air Vista in our, our little warehouse classroom that we have over there. Um, but there might be some adjustments. Mm -hmm. And if I could just, while I'm here, I'm just going to say that the high school adoption was projected at $211,761. The remainder is for elementary. All right. Thank you very much. Moving on to the next. <coughs> public comments. During the public comments portion of the meeting or during any agenda item, there's an opportunity for the public to speak. Public members who address the board will be limited to a maximum of three minutes per speaker and 20 minutes per total per topic. For more information, please see the page one of the agenda tonight. This meeting is being recorded for use in the official minutes. Uh, minutes. Okay, we have two tonight. First one is from Wendy Kreiner, Bray resident. As our COVID numbers are improving as a county and city, as well as the additional addition of vaccines, I would like to encourage the board to consider progressing the opening of schools to include more days on campus for those that choose to attend. I recognize that all, not all families are ready for this, but as a parent of two students that have attended hybrid, it makes a huge difference to their motivation towards academics and their overall social emotional well being. Our students should be able to be on campus and engaged in their learning, working with their teachers, their classmates, and involved in clubs, athletics for more than two days a week. With the current number of, number of attending students, it seems reasonable to allow hybrid students the option to attend two or four days on campus for Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Even more so with the improvement of our numbers. Please consider to modify the current hybrid schedule to allow for more on-campus days. Thank you for your time. We appreciate all you have done to work with the families and community to ensure a safe and healthy return. Next one is from Carly Zemudio, Fortin resident. I'm writing into the school board as a parent and a teacher here in Bray Oland Unified School District. I know that our hands are somewhat tied as a district right now, but I cannot continue to sit in silence and let this child abuse continue. I am speaking to the parents and teachers that are concerned about the irreversible damage 
that has already been done to our children in the past year and the continuing damage that is being caused to them if we continue to allow the status quo. Only we together can make a difference change. I struggle sometimes with speaking out since I am a teacher in the district. So many of us are staying silent as we are tired or don't wanna rock the boat. But when I see my own nine-year-old son depressed, not sleeping or eating and crying before bedtime because going back to school isn't what he thought it was, I need to speak out. Last night, my son finally broke down in tears to me, asking me, why are the teachers doing this? I explained to him that it is not the teachers making these rules. In fact, most teachers do not agree with what is going on. I speak to many of them, even if they stay silent. He cried about having to carry his plexiglass thing around with him to keep him away from his friends and teachers. He cried that he and his friends cannot sit together and must stay six feet apart from each other inside and outside. He cried that they have no equipment to play on, on or outside, and that they are constantly being told to keep their bacteria-filled oxygen deprivation masks on their face all day. Side note, if you really believe these masks work, you are highly misinformed. Research the damage it's causing to your child's brain, body, social, and emotional development. My son was so excited to return to school as he hated Zoom. And while this tiny crumb we have been handed of returning to in-person learning is better than Zooming, it is not enough and it is not in our children's best interest. As a parent and educator, I don't understand why more of us aren't standing up for what is right for these kids. They are the future. And if you don't care about these kids for whatever reason, just remember these kids will be taking care of you one day. These children who are not receiving any uh, an appropriate education, proper socialization, physical activity, and so much more, these are the children who will be running this country and taking care of us. As I end, I also want to add that hybrid is, is not working. It does not work for the students or the teachers. Every teacher I have spoken with agrees. There needs to be teachers who teach in person and teachers who teach students who wish to continue to stay on distance learning. Forcing teachers to do both is not beneficial to us or the students. We cannot teach to those in person when we have to sit in front of a computer with the other students. Thank you for reading my comment. That completes our public comments. We've got number seven, approval of minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. Anders? Second? I second, Miller. Miller? Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Consent calendar. Do I have a motion? Lyons? Second. Flanders? Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yes. This new. Uh, Got a couple people to go first. <laughs> yeah, sure. Go ahead. Mr. Champion, can you explain, uh, just give us more information on E, F, and G, please? Just as kind of a breakdown. So we. E, F, and G. What? Oh, I'll do that after. No. Yeah, I'm right here. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. My assumption is on uh, four, correct? E, F, and G? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Staff is requesting an increase um, of bringing um, independent contracts to the board and increase on a level for efficiency, um, especially during the summer months as we um, only have one board meeting, from increasing the threshold from 5,000 to 25,000. And the 25,000 number kind of came from the public work sector where we would be requiring performance and payment bonds from our contractors. So it seemed like a good fit to increase that level from five to 25. So staff's recommending um, such approval action. Okay. Is there an actual board? Um... Policy or, or right. yeah, is there, there is an actual policy? There, where... there, there isn't. So we've always adopted this at the beginning of every year. Okay. Um, yes, it should be, but we, we're gonna get to that process eventually. So um, E, excuse me, F, which is agreement with school facility consultants. So, um, there is a number of facility credits that are in calculation dollars from the state based upon modernization and a whole array of calculations that's required by the state. So it's our, um, we've done this in the past. This is one of our vendors, but we're bringing this forth because obviously we have to certify reports that are beyond the capacity of the district to prepare, just because of the complexity of it. And school facility consultants, a current vendor, we're asking for approval of this to move forward at this amount, not to exceed. 
as we look forward and get in line and get our credits as we prepare and start projecting for the future, we'll obviously apply for credits. And if the state ever funds those credits and makes good on their commitments, then we will be in line to get those and not at the back of the line in, in preparing those. So staff's recommending an agreement with the school facility consultants to move forward on that. E, not to exceed from the fund um, 25, which is our capital facilities fund. Um, G, agreement with Power School. So this is a current vendor also. You've probably seen these online as you go and put your address in and find out what school district, you, what boundary you belong to on the elementary side. We um, want to get more efficient on bringing in all of our data inputs. We have data inputs from ARIES, our student services. We have data inputs from HR staffing for reports and building, and also from the city about looking at enrollment and demands of construction. This program or an expansion of the program that we currently have will allow us now to access real-time data from our school services program, ARIES, and allow us to project enrollment, staffing, impacts from city development, and a variety of other federal and state reporting that we would have to go out and search in multiple locations. And as you know, when you have more hands, sometimes the data gets out. So staff's recommending an agreement with Power Schools to Decision Insights, actually what it's called, to increase it. We're looking at a three-year program not to exceed um, $12,000 per year of this program. We won't have to buy the other $1,000, so it actually will net out a little bit cheaper for us. Moving forward from the Capital Facilities Fund, not the General Fund, perfect vehicle for those dollars that are tied to enrollment growth. So this will greatly increase our efficiency and our capacity to project. Thank you. Uh, Gail is next. Um, well, one of them we already covered, but uh, let's see. So that's decision, it used to be decision insight, correct? Yeah, they got, they got purchased by Power School and now they're being purchased by Hewitt or who did it, okay. but right now the agreement's with Power School. So you feel, I, I, it just seems like they've been the vendor of choice for so long that, I mean, are they, so obviously they're getting better at what they do because they're incorporating all these different facets to their product yeah. because they were pretty clunky before. Yeah. Um, so is there anybody else out there that competes? For there them? is, we've looked at, we've, the districts currently use them. So our database actually is, there, as you recall, we had our um, study session a couple months ago. We actually used one of their graphs when we plotted out our students. Right. That came from 1617 data. So they did at that time back in the day. And thank goodness we have Barbara Ott here because she's our historian, that it was an easy transition and will be an easy transition when they work with Derek about setting up the interchange. So we will get data real time as we go forward and project. So. Um, and they were recommended to, and then of course, since they are a current vendor, we knew how they operate. And we've, I've actually now reached that they've out. been bought two times. I don't know. Do you know how they operate? Um, I don't see an issue so far with our, with our, uh, locator service. So, um, but yes, they're, you know, technology is getting better. It's getting more and more accurate. We're spending incredible amount of man hours just for just staffing, you know, and then we get so many points of um, data that obviously get, they get contaminated and, you know, not in a bad way, but things just, you know, well, this, it's, this it's is exciting. This is, I think it's yeah. really exciting to see the output that they can give. I think yeah. our big frustration with decision insight in years past was that they were never right. I mean, they were never in close to the predictions. Yeah. I mean, now it's using our data. Oh, wait. Yeah. 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 Now it's using our data and the, the, the development piece now, as you know, um, our relationship with the city planning and that department upstairs, we're on the second floor for those that don't know that, the third step is getting better. So we're actually, I'm gonna take their data and import it into our, it's not just spreadsheets anymore. It's actually real information. And of course it's assumptions, of course it's just projections and they're gonna be wrong. But if we can combine it with real information, then we'll see trends and then that'll actually help us project and um, our ability to move forward with, with a little bit more certainty is what yeah. we're looking for. Yeah. Well, and that would be great. Yeah, I'm excited about it. It's, yeah, it's very it, it's exciting. very exciting. What you our said. assistant superintendent of HR, who's sitting off camera, he's, when he's she ready. saw the staffing piece, sold. Done, done. Done deal, because st stuff that would take her hours and days, just plopping in months, a number. is, That's awesome. 
like that's that. Great. Obviously, that's great. data in, data out, but it's real data from information from our Aries. Okay. Um, so with excited the about facility it. consultants yes. agreement. So the things that are on there. So you're getting in line. What's on here? Are these the only things that can then be if you if you are granted the funding? Are these the only things that you can use it on? Um, you listed some things. I mean, there's things listed out there, um, you know, site maps and things like that. But then you specifically there's listed the Olinda Elementary Multipurpose. Yeah, room. we we still have an application for uh, funding from the Olinda MPR that if the state because it, it varies about your enrollment and your impact and your growth. So if the state allocates dollars to the state building grants that were in the past, which probably not going to, but this is more forward looking document, then we will be in line to receive any additional dollars. Does it forward. have to be for that school is what I'm asking. Anything that we have in line with the OPSC, which is the architect state of- They, they do analysis for each of our schools, because all of our schools have different ages. And so they all qualify um, for modernization funds as they age. And so it's not, you don't age as a district, you age as individual schools. And there's also for new development, new buildings. So as Brea is anticipating building new buildings, mm -hmm. we need to be current in our projections and sharing of information with the state. And that's what this does for us. And so as we, um, so when we built the MPR at Olinda, because it used to be a small school, they still treated it as the school that they knew. There was there was money that we could, we started our project and we submitted it to the state and we got reimbursement for portions of that project. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do this, but your credits that you possibly qualify for, for both new construction as well as modernization, other other districts in the state will just spend your money for you. So you right. have to submit this in order to get in line when you go to do modernization projects or you go to do expansion projects. Right. I guess, you know, I would <clears throat> I would just wonder why Falcon wasn't under there for a new multi-purpose room. Oh. Yeah, it's just, it's a calculation based on a number of factors. The, 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 the best part of it is if we go forward and start planning for future projects, because they're going to be replacing older buildings, it will help us develop a budget that state district contributes so much, so much for modernization from the credit. You know, the state is entertaining another school facilities bond in 2022. So we need to be in line with projects and the applications of stuff too, to just tap into these state resources. Because as we talked during measure G, if the state facility bond passed and we didn't pass measure G, they both failed by the way, then, then we as taxpayers would be paying taxes to the state and not uh, tapping into the state modernization fund credit. So I, I, it's kind of a cost of, and again- yes, I was just curious to know if it was like specific to what's being said in this document, because you know <clears throat> Falcon's the only school that doesn't yeah. have a multi-purpose but, room. But so. Falcon, you would not qualify, would qualify for an NPR for modernization if, they have to run the metrics. And if they come back and say that you qualify based on your, your enrollments at, and growth at Falcon, you qualify for $800,000 worth of funds. And that can go towards 40% of a future project. We would need to initiate the project. There's no money that comes. It's basically a reimbursement credit for a project that you initiate and move forward on. And it's only after school facilities, school facilities, capital facilities, school facilities consultants do the analysis that they feed back. So it informs us as we pick projects, we're something where we would be spending every one of the dollars would belong to us. And which are some projects that we might be able to consider that would be offset by credits that would come from the state. They have no money right now. They will sell a new bond, but if you never get in line and you don't submit your, your yearly reports, they'll, you'll just, it will be money for other people. Right. And I, I, yeah. I'm totally for that. Again, it just was a question yeah. in the back of my head. And I, we're going to talk about that as we go forward <coughs> about facilities. But I know we didn't get a bond, but I would still advocate for always, you know, especially with the computer program there that we have. And they, they just don't have any space to do any of that work. I mean, they don't have any mm. space it's to do that space. work. Sure. <laughs> That's yeah. all I can say. Yeah. Yeah. Ina. 
I just wanted to make a comment about E for raising from 5,000 to 25,000, how it will help with the PTAs and PTOs when they spend money. A lot of times if it's over 5,000, we have to wait for a school board meeting to get it approved. So raising this will help, there won't be delays. So I just want everybody to know that too. Yeah, that's correct. And if I can speak to that as well, this, this doesn't mean that Rick gets to start or any of us get to start purchase would still come here for for ultimate the adoption and through the warrant and so forth so th this isn't money that we aren't do this, this is the purposeful work that we know that we're engaged in we have a five thousand dollar throttle on us right now that says you can't move forward until you get board approval to do this project um, five thousand dollars used to get a lot of things done if you needed to replace the tires on a bus right now you'd be hard pressed to do that and and we, we, we want board direction, we want board guidance, we want board authority, but we just need to just raise that ceiling to, to a more practical modern day total so we don't keep having to wait till another board meeting to move forward on work we know we need to do. So that's all. Thanks, Rick. Any more questions? Seeing none. I wanted to, real quick, I just wanted to mention the donors this month. Uh, the Brea Korea Sister City Association, Esther M., I donated a thousand dollars this month. Um, part of it's going to the, the Korean program. The other part's going to the junior high, which is great. Also, uh, Germ Free Plus gave us 300 two ounce spray bottles, which is really nice. That's actually going to back to school teacher gifts. And OCDE provided a ton of PPE equipment, mask sanitizers, masks, masks, all kinds of things. And I just wanted to say thanks to them too. That said, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Passes five zero. No public hearing tonight. Information, discussion, and direction. Reopening of schools update. Presenters, Dr. Mason and Rick Torres. Thank you. Carrie is uh, making her way back up. <laughs> And uh, we'll get her own um, lapel mic just so she can, uh, you know, chime in throughout the course of the evening. Um, thank you for allowing us to give another update for um, for just our reopening of schools. And um, we, we've got kind of a, a two front battle that we're that we're continuing to fight. That what's the most we can continue to look at doing in the course of the last third or so of the twenty twenty one. 2020-2021 um, school year, and then we also have to have an eye on the 2021-22 school year as we make plans. And our goal for the remainder of this year is to um, attempt to do the most we possibly can, given the um, the limitations that are imposed on us by the five different um, governing bodies that that govern our work. Um, and uh, we, we hear from lots of parents and, and, and folks and, and a teacher, you know, um, sent something in during public comments, just frustrated because um, people often hear from a particular source that, you know, something's allowed per something they heard and whether that was CDC put out something new or whatever, but CDC, CDC is the federal kind of advisor for the collective health of the country, but we are governed not just by that, we're also governed by the California Department of Public Health, which then filters down to the Orange County Healthcare Agency. There are compliance issues that we have to work with and submit um, our plans to Orange County Department of Ed. Um, for sports and athletics, we have not just the California Department of Public Health, but we also have CIF and rules that we must follow with them. And because we have um, a workforce, we also have Cal OSHA, and I'm probably forgetting, AAA might even have something to say about it, I don't even know. But um, uh, we continually, whenever something new comes out, we kind of, in, in our kind of war room, conference room right off of my office, we, we bring the documents that, that are germane to all of our work and try to govern, um, you know, and make sense of it. And one example um, is a conference call that I'm going to be on with um, the 27 or 28 other county superintendents in Orange County tomorrow that we are always on on Friday after or Friday mornings. Um, Dr. Chow um, and Dr. Nunez with Orange County Healthcare Agency will be on trying to help provide some guidance because Dr. Bardock, 
who is um, newly assigned by the governor, was with us a couple of weeks ago, and she referenced um, the potential ability moving from a six foot to a four foot um, recommendation as far as social distancing in classrooms. But people, people, the um, Orange County Healthcare Agency pointed to other documents that um, have called into question whether we have they have the authority. And so one of the questions we have tomorrow is that can Orange County Healthcare Agency come out with just a blanket approval for districts in Orange County to use four feet instead of the recommended um, or required six feet. And there was a, a slurry of emails just before going into closed session this afternoon. Um, it, it, you be careful replying to or, or responding to the latest email because it's about to be followed by another one. And so we've put a, a, a proposal together for approval from Orange County Healthcare Agency. So, um, you know, one of the things that we'll talk about, and Carrie can mention as well, of trying to maximize the remainder of this school year. Bar none, there is nobody that doesn't want us coming back five days a week, normal next year. And normal may mean mask, normal may mean hand sanitizer that we're swimming in, but normal to us means five days a week back in school, following schedules that we'd recognize. Now, well, we need to potentially alter recesses and look at different things with lunches and get creative. Absolutely. But our, our, the end zone for us is five days a week. And that's what we're pushing towards as well as the other um, superintendents in the county. What we need though, are the regulatory authorities that oversee our work to respond in kind and say, yes, your, your, your plans are approved. We do not have that approval yet, but we are going to be continuing to push towards that for the fall. And this year, um, <clears throat> you know, hearing people say, well, you know, if, if my child is in a classroom that is, um, you know, under attended in any particular period, what's preventing him or her from coming back four days a week? And I'll let Carrie talk to that in, in just a minute. But um, <clears throat> our health indices in, in Orange County and Brea continue to be um, really good. Um, a week ago, two Tuesdays ago, we were a, a positivity rate of 2.7. Again, if you remember back in January, we were at a high of 18%. We are living in a zone where there are numbers that qualify us for the orange category in the tier system, but the way that the governor set up the, the tier system, we're still in purple. We're not only not in orange, we're not in red, we're in still in the most restrictive. We were, we've lived at red numbers this week, and if we have that one more week, we will be able to move to the red. But again, you have to sit in the red for three weeks, and in the last two weeks of the red, <coughs> excuse me, in the last two weeks of the red, you need to be in orange and stay there for two weeks, and then you can transition to orange, but then you'll need to stay there for three weeks. In the last two weeks of those three weeks, you need to be in yellow in order to transition to yellow. So we are still in the most restrictive um, tier. However, because the numbers um, do show improvement, we're just being held up in progressing forward. <clears throat> by the, the system that was created, we're asking for flexibility within that system moving forward. And we're asking for great flexibility for the fall. So we will continue to bring that forward and monitor. Um, we would love to see regulations move from six to four. If the health agencies say that that is um, <clears throat> safe enough based on their, their scientific, um, you know, their, their medical opinion, then we will look at that. However, we have been very, and the board has been very, um, very methodical. Cabinet has been very methodical in bringing recommendations that say um, we, we are looking at who needs <clears throat> um, who needs our help the most. We would love to just throw the doors back open and welcome everybody back, knowing that we can't do that right now. Um, how we started coming back, we had some of our most um, at risk special education populations. We had our at risk population at Brea Canyon come back first. We had our adult transition um, special education program um, come back. <clears throat> and we have got students that um, are suffering that we know because we've been supporting and interfacing with them social, emotionally, um, mental health. 
um, just general well-being that more days at school would be better than less days at school. We know that's good for everybody, but we, we, have, we have a higher at-risk population. We also have <clears throat> students, you know, seniors that are not on target for graduation and, and getting people back that we need to absolutely work on getting to the finish line. That's going to be our first our first lens or our first filter of looking if, if we are able to bring larger population back, we're gonna continue to walk through in a very um, methodical process. Um, and if you think of it as triage, um, students that are in, in the greatest greatest need will, will have our first attention. And I don't know if there's a, a better or different way to say that, Carrie, but um, would like to just uh, throw it over to Carrie to talk a little bit about some of the other things that we're working on and, um, feedback that we've gotten, athletics, summer plans for mitigation. And so we've got lots of things to still talk about. Yeah. And as Dr. Mason has explained tonight, you know, reopening of schools is an exceptionally complex issue and, and lots of dynamics um, that go into it. But one of the things that we're very proud of in Bray is the fact that we've been very strategic and methodical in our approach to reopening the schools at each leg of this race that we've uh, been on here. And so one of the great things to share with the community is that as um, we have reopened our latest reopening in February, you know, we've been able to launch our athletics program, be able to get students back on campus, you know, and that has emerged from those pieces of guidance that Dr. Mason referred to. And that's evolved to now we're actually having, you know, athletic competitions that are coming forward. And so that's been an exciting piece for our students because we know that the socio-emotional health and wellness of kids is important. We saw those opening videos, if you were with us in the beginning, talking about the mental health of our students and the climate that kids live in. And so those little pieces that we've been able to bring to them um, have been, been beneficial to the over 400 athletes who've been able to participate. Um, that's an exciting piece that continues to grow. Um, we have exciting plans for summer. And so as you heard earlier in the budget presentation, the federal government has been um, generous with the state of California, and we ex anticipate receiving dollars to support a robust summer program. So um, Brenda Leone and I are meeting with our associations tomorrow to discuss our early concepts for the summer program that would be inclusive of um, students in elementary school and grade seven through 12. So we're really hope hoping that our associations are open to hearing our new plan and supporting students to increase their learning and boost um, boost them into the next grade level. And so we're looking at doing that at uh, the transition. So we're excited about that. And hopefully by the time I see you again at our next board meeting, we'll be able to present that plan to you. Um, we engage teachers along the way in this process. And so their voice is important and their experiences in the classroom are important. So we continue to take their feedback. Um, and right now as a community, we have our thought exchange that's going on and closes tomorrow. And um, we're taking feedback regarding the reopening plan. Um, so we have asked the community, you know, what would you like to see, you know, once COVID-19 sunsets and we reopen schools as, as temporarily regular or normal as we can next year. And so I'm very pleased to say that as of tonight, um, we have 1,215 parents who've given us feedback. So we exceeded our goal of 1,000. And I have over 367 eighth graders um, that have given me feedback and 117 seniors so far. Um, that's important to us because we take that and give, um, take that feedback and incorporate it into our opening plans. Um, you know, we're taking a look at some of the more important groups who had some loss last year. You know, we look at our, our uh, senior class, right? So they didn't have some of those opportunities that we would have loved to them to have last year. So while we're looking at that four day a week plan, where we're looking at what can we do to support bringing additional kids on campus while we can't have everyone, can we have additional, you heard Dr. Mason referring to um, at risk students, um, students who are struggling in school, students who have severe socio-emotional like mental health issues, we wanna bring them back. But we also wanna look um, at our senior class and just what are some of the activities and things that we can support um, with our 12th graders. And so Dr. Porter and his team and I will have been and will continue to discuss what are some of those opportunities as we move from purple to red to orange to get my color scheme right. Um, that will allow us some of those flexibilities and try to bring back some of those, um, you know, irreplaceable moments um, in high school that we missed last year. Um, and I think for now, that's probably the most important pieces. Um, Dr. Mason already, has already commented and, 
you know, we, we would like nothing more than to have everybody back on campus. We're going to do what we can to bring as many kids back that fall into those categories as possible. And just want the community to know that we're working hard to take a very strategic approach so that we can stay on course. That's most important. So that by the time we hit August, we can actually open the doors as we anticipate. Um, my question's in regards to summer school. I know it's premature because you haven't had association meetings, but is the vision on Zoom or is it the vision on per in person? So for elementary school, we're going to suggest that students come on campus. And so we'd be running um, basically some 10 day workshops for students focused in English language arts and mathematics center based learning to bring kids back in in small groups. Um, we know that learning loss mitigation funds is what we call it because that's what the federal government calls it. We're calling it boost learning. We wanna raise kids up because not everything has been bad this year. Learning has occurred. We just wanna make sure kids get that extra, um, extra bump. And so we feel though that while kids experience distance learning for the last, I don't know, what has it been, 16 months or something, <laughs> you know, over a school year, we really feel we want to bring them back and have them in seat. And I know that our teachers believe that too, that being in the classroom, having hands-on learning is the best place. In um, seventh and eighth grade, we'll do some type of combination of that. Um, secondary schools run a little bit differently. The needs of students and what they're achieving is different. So that will be a blended program. So you'll see some hybrid learning going on there. Hybrid meaning kids will receive some distance learning um, like they have in the past, if you've experienced our high school summer program, and they'll have some check-in time with their teachers. So it'll be a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Moving on to number two is the board meeting efficiency. Before we start, I want to read a public comment that's fit, fitting for that area. Jim Bailey, Bradley resident. Members of the board, good evening. I'm writing to express objections to the changes in how public comments are presented and included in the record. While it may be true that public comments have increased since board meetings have gone virtual and that takes up more time, this increased participation should be seen as a positive and should be encouraged. Comment summaries and cutoffs after 20 minutes per topic do not encourage participation and can lead to misperception of how seriously a topic is being taken by the board or the community. It also establishes a dangerous precedent of cutting off the public's voice as it is a vital part of our representative government. Someone motivated enough to take the time to write a comment or come speak should have their comment heard within the context of the meeting. In today's very short news and communication cycles, waiting for complete written public comments to be published increases the possibility of misinformation, taking root or a counterpoint being missed. Once this occurs, it can be very hard to, or impossible to undo. Please read out all public comments according to the three minute rule to honor and encourage participation in our local government. I'd like to dedicate public comment to the memory of my friend, Rick Clark, who's always supportive of the best interests of Brea, our students and, a, and good governance. He will be missed. Thank you, Jim Bailey, Brea Payne. So um, this topic was agendized to address the recent and future changes to our agenda that I've been trying to institute and how to make our meetings more efficient so that businesses may be, may, business may be conducted. It's a key for all of us to note that these meetings are designed to be meetings held in public, not public meetings such as town halls or, exchange, or thought exchanges. So keeping that in mind, I wanna to start tonight with, uh, we'll start with public comments since Jim led us into that. And I, Nicole, you requested the agenda item. Would you like to start the conversation? Absolutely. Um, I just, you know, I brought this forth because of the abrupt way in which it was brought to uh, the board. Um, I, I can appreciate wanting to uh, make our meetings more efficient. And I understand the fatigue factor of, of reading two hours plus of public comments, having done it for many meetings last year. Um, but I did that because we were in the middle of a pandemic and our public needed to be heard. Um, I was very shocked that we did this in the middle of a, of a crisis situation where our Laurel families were trying to be heard. Um, the cutoff time of noon without any notice to the public 
Um, I was surprised by that. I think that we still need to notify our public if we are going to continue with these changes that we need to send an email to our employees as well as put it out on our social media to let people know this is a change in our practice because after having a year of people knowing that they could come up until the last hour uh, before our meeting to leave a comment and we all know those last the last hour was when those comments all came in um, so if we are going to change our practice i would like to notify our public in a very transparent way um, I also I'm not in favor of the two of the noon cutoff. I would like to look at moving it till two to give um, people who have a lunch break the opportunity during the lunch hour to send in a comment. Um, and that's that's pretty much my my big thing. I just want to make sure our public is aware of our change in practice because I don't feel that they were aware when we just changed it. I think yeah. Yeah. Uh, we going back to when when are people going to come back in here <laughs> because I mean it makes a lot of difference. We're not going to be reading comments hopefully yeah. someday. To to that end, great question. Um, put it in our, our our last Friday update, but that's the the world doesn't get that. Um, when we move back to red, we can move to twenty five percent capacity in here, which is we were in red for a while, and and I remember coming down here and counting, and I give or take that's that's twelve people, something like that, twelve to fourteen people. Um, <clears throat> when we move to to orange and to yellow, um, you can move to 50% occupancy. There is no change from moving from orange to yellow. You would just kind of like be at 50% until the tears go away or COVID does. Um, so when might we be back to 100% in the kind of the olden days? I have absolutely no idea. But if we continue to make progress, we could be at 25% audience capacity by the next time we meet and then within three more weeks if we continue to trend in the right direction we could be at 50 percent capacity but think of that as a month from now i mean it's just really causing us to think through all of what sure. we do and how we do it mm -hmm. having done this over zoom mm -hmm. for so long um you know you say 25 percent capacity so in essence at our next meeting people, even if they don't stay for the meeting, you can mm -hmm. queue them up outside Absolutely. with 60 feet apart yes. and, and yes. they could come in and, and have their comment mm -hmm. at the podium. Yes. So, I mean, I just, I agree in the spirit of efficiency, but I, I struggle with this one because we are, we, we've just been a small community where people feel like they can <clears throat> come. And <throat> if they feel passionate about an, an item, they can come talk about it. And it just, so and and we all know there's game playing that goes on and even jockeying for a position in when your comments gonna you know come before. So, so for, for my clarity, you're speaking of the 20 minutes per topic more than the cutoff. Yeah, time. I'd probably be more comfortable with like a 30 minute cutoff and even maybe as a guideline, not a hard. That's it. We won't accept anything past 30 minutes. Um, because I just look at the things we've had over the past few years and I just don't know that that would have been a fair, um, it would have been a fair process for everyone to have been or felt heard. And then again, if they can queue up and come into the podium, we also need to think about, you know, in, in council meetings, they have the ability to zoom in their comments. So they don't have to physically come to the podium right now. Even right now they do that it matters for the <clears throat> audience, right? Mm -hmm. So, right, but I mean, I think that that might be something that stays though, right? I mean, why wouldn't it? We have this capability now to get people into this room and that's what we've always wanted. We've always wanted people to pay more attention to what happens in a school board meeting. And we know it's hard, it's exhausting to come here and sit through the whole thing, but we want, we want people to engage. We want them to know what we're doing. We want to have their input on what we're doing. So, 
I just, I really struggle with limiting any of that for them to not feel as if we want their input. So I don't know if that's very clear <laughs> or if it falls into any of those three questions, but, um, and then just looking ahead to what do we, how do we want to handle this going forward? I think it'd be great if people could zoom in their comments um, and stand, you know, we could see them on the screen. I don't know if that's, do we have that capability? I don't know. I mean, you just think about that as opening a door for people who never had that opportunity. There's a mom sitting at home, dad's at work, and she wants to comment in the school board meeting. I mean, you could do it. I mean, what more would I, I just those kinds of things make me happy to think about that people would actually engage and feel like they could, and there weren't a lot of barriers to have them engage. So um, I'm always, I always wanna hear from, from our community. I think it's really important that they feel we want to hear them. Um, my friend? Yeah, what okay. would you say? Mind if I go? Oh, no, sure. Or you wanna go first? I don't even care at this point. I'll jump in. Um, first up, I, I did a little, schematic of every single school district unified district in the county every almost every single one of them has a three minute per, per speaker thing and most of them have 20 well actually it's 20 15 30 20 30 20 20 30 20 30 that's their limits that's all they limit it to and per topic not not overall just per topic so um, our public comments range from two emails to 57 emails. At our last meeting, for example, we had approximately 20 emails on different topics, and they were all read in the 20 minute time frame. I was able to take a deep breath and get most of them read before 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay, so um, then why do you need a limit? Well, we're not stifling the public's voice because of if the, even if the time limit is reached, I still have the option of actually continuing on if, if it's a, con a conversation we want to keep having. But that said, all emails received will be attached to the minutes the following morning. So whether or not your email is read out loud, it is still attached to our official minutes and people from all over the county can read your comment the next day. It's not like we're hiding them or shredding them in a shredder. Um, the, this policy change to read emails submitted to the board was created to facilitate an open dialogue during COVID. Once we are back to normal, which I personally believe we will be back sooner than later, uh, we will return to our original format of having speakers live in the chamber and the emailing of comments won't be utilized. Um, so I just kind of want to get a consensus of what we think we should do here. If we should do a 20 minute time limit with, you know, like we're doing now. Um, the cutoff time for me is you have 14 days to write an email to us. And if you decide oh. to wait until one o'clock in the afternoon, the day of the meeting to write an email. But the agenda is not posted until Monday. Yeah. Until we've Monday, got, so you have four days to write an email. Yeah, we've got 72 hours because when the agenda posts at five o'clock-ish or so, um, by five o'clock on Monday, there's a 72 hour window before the meeting starts. If it's at noon, you dial that back five hours. So instead of 72, it's 67 hours. People, I mean, emails are open to any all or all of us throughout the time, but to, to truly get, I want to make sure that it's clear in order to be considered for comments. Currently it's 67 hours from the, the Monday at five until the noon, two o'clock would give it two more. So that would be 69. We'd gone up till five. And so we'd had the full 72 prior to um, last meeting. Okay. The reality <clears> of that <throat> time frame, though is that, you know, not a lot of our communities waiting for five o'clock on Monday for the agenda to be posted to see what we're talking about. You know, if there's something that's concerning to one person, it either gets posted on social media or the word of mouth spreads that, oh my gosh, they're talking about this particular subject. Well, then you've got probably another day before that hits and people are aware. I mean, so it does take some time for people to really know what we're doing too sometimes. It's not like, I mean, we're not top news, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so, But I would say, I would actually counter that with the last two major um, issues we've had to deal with. People online were telling them to email us three weeks before the meeting even started. And the one before that, there was an entire group telling people all over the county to email us. And we were getting those emails way before, where they were coming, they were lining up to come in. So 
I think if there's really something that really matters to the community, A, we're going to have a pulse of it, and B, we're already going to know about it, and they're going to be writing in before the meeting even, the agenda even goes out. But on so, the but on the last issue uh, that we dealt with with our Laurel community, yeah. the majority of the statement of the comments came in the last hour, and and that's my concern is that we need to make sure that our community knows if we are changing the process. Okay. I actually just want to speak on that one real quick. Um, prior to this year, we had a different board here and um a lot of the th the items came in last minute because they were being texted and asked to quickly email one more i remember times when our executive assistant was running into we met we started meeting in person was running in with one more letter as we were having our closed session um that's a lot that's a that's a lot of um work on on her part and uh, one man job over there, one woman job. Um, so I wanna be respectful of that work. So I, I guess, and I also don't think having have that, those last minute comments were made in, um, in a selfish way for someone to get attention. I don't know how else to say that and you know exactly what I'm talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. So that is the last minute while we're sitting here, comments trying to come through are um, better re better received from us if they are from people that win. Thank goodness it sounds like the next meeting when they're in the room or if we figure out a way that they can actually zoom in, not letters and the room and the zoom and the it, I just think it's it's um, a paperwork nightmare. But what I did want to say that was just kind of in response to that. Um, so, you know, I'm super like research based. So I was, I have the same thing. I think you actually, it was in our, one of our Friday reports. So I know we're the only district, uh, unified district actually that doesn't have a per topic. And you asked why then if as a board president or a board, if we had 22 minutes, would we, we would probably, I mean, we're reasonable people. We would probably say, could you just please read the other two? And we would all, I, I see consensus that we would probably continue. Right. If we had two hours more and we had a huge topic ourselves to have to do the work on, I wouldn't, wouldn't be for continuing to read another hundred letters. Um, and, and same in the room, because those, the 20 minutes time limit on those other districts are not just because of this COVID. That's actually, I'm seeing nodding back there. That's actually, a, a protocol that's a process that's in place and has been in place for most boards for a long, long time in the room for the reason that you can conduct board business. So not just that research, but it also started, oh goodness, I started reading my books again, which then I got in a rabbit hole because I found, you know, this is so much fun to read so much governance, but it is good to revisit, isn't it? And I did find something that, that kind of struck me because I was asking myself the same thing. Why a limit? If, if we made it in the 20-ish minutes last time, why a limit, Let, why? So I wanted to know, and I read something that really, really hit home with me. Find, finding balance between the board's right to set rules of efficiency um, for running meetings versus the public's right to free speech, because I too value the, hearing the public and, and the letter, the emails we get on topics that people don't want to, come or they don't want to be known but they want to let us know how they feel or the phone calls they do they do help shape how we think and feel and understand what's going on so I'm, i don't think anyone here is trying to stifle the public um, or at least that was never your intent um, i think that the process was to um, streamline many efficiencies and just be better at this and i like rules and i like following them so i also um start thinking about that sentence I just read to you. And fair limitations are necessary. This is in the um, Brown Act. Limitations are necessary to complete our business in a reasonable, timely manner. Time and topic limits, signing in with your name, your identification, um, prohibitions against vulgar and threatening speech are all best practices of an efficient board. No one has ever kept a person from expressing their free speech. Oh, this is my own sentence. And um, there's no intent to do that now. Um, so those were just 
those are reasons for me. I think having, I read something um, from another board and that talked about not having any rules in place and structure in case you needed them um, and how inefficient that board ran. And there was a whole, a whole thing on this, this whole uh, dissertation actually on it. And I just don't think it hurts us to have structure. So um, I am willing, I mean, I'm flexible on if you feel that 30 minutes is um, more reasonable. I actually agree with notifying the public of any changes that we make. Um, I do think that when a person goes to write in or come in, they will see the change. They'll know I need three minutes or I have five or I have 20 or, I have, you know, and it is a first come first serve basis. Um, so, uh, and in a crisis situation, Nicole, I think, or maybe it was Gail, one of you said crisis, I wrote that down. Um, you know, we, we have had, I don't know when we haven't had a crisis situation, to be honest, but um, when we get to the, a crisis situation that we feel like there's a lot that we haven't heard yet, then I think we reevaluate at that time. Um, but, but, you know, recently we've had two midnight meetings and I don't know if the public knew that after the, we, tonight we're going back upstairs again. So if the public knew how much work we do later into the night and the decisions we have to make at that time, when, well, I, you have friends, I have friends, when they find out how, what time I got home, they're like, what? Did you sign up for that? So I don't mind doing the work, but I want to do it when I'm awake. And I want to do it when I'm like ready to hear and listen to everybody. So um, I don't know, for that, I would like to have some kind of, um, I want us to find our balance for efficiency in this topic. Dina. Okay. Um, I researched a couple different districts also. And now that we have a new communications person, I found a district that has a tab on their website for opinions, comments, and concerns, because I honestly don't feel like everybody who does public comments necessarily wants to be heard by the public. They want the district to know and they want action. They may not be interested in waiting the two weeks. So some people, if they just had a tab on our website, they could just go to, it's a Google form, just like our Google form for public comments, fill it out. They ask the e uh, email, name, phone number, child school, and then what their comment is. I think that could be a good communication for people um, as well as coming to our meetings or zooming in however we do. It's something I would like to consider. Um, I too am okay with a 20 minute, 30 minute time frame per topic. Um, with that, Carrie mentioned it just a little bit. I think we should have board approval, not just the president approval, if we wanted to extend longer than 20, because I, I think it's important it's not made by just one decision, it would be made by all of us. And if we are a couple minutes, I'm sure we would all stay. But again, like you said, we're a public meeting in public, we're not a public meeting for everybody so to be able to be heard and they will be heard in the minutes that's my my big thing you can see what they have said um but i definitely think a decision needs to be made tonight it's kind of a quiet night let's take advantage of that and just make a decision move on will we adjust possibly sure we might adjust this but i think we do need some kind of a time frame like carrie said you know, these are long nights. I'm not complaining, but I do like to sleep. So that's just, and just my thought. I, I know this is your discussion, but also to Gail's earlier point, there is somewhat of an expiration date on this. The, the, the comment of, you know, their comments will be seen in the, in, the, in the minutes. That's true when everything's written. When we go back to a speaking and you pick a 20 minute or you pick a 30 minute per topic, it is conceivable that someone turns in 50 blue slips and and that shuffles them around to randomize them so people don't sleep outside thinking I need to spend the night so I can be the first to speak. They're literally randomized and shuffled and it's you just go for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. At that point, it is conceivable that there are blue slips that don't make the minutes because the time ran out. So just want to make sure we're clear thinking in. We're talking about a finite time when we're, oh, I don't know why this is off, sorry. Um, um, Get your thoughts. That, that, this is a, that this is a finite time that we're also talking about when we're all in just a write-in, in, in a write-in mode. And it's true that all of them go the next day to, um, to the agenda, but, um, 
that that isn't the case when we go back to in person speaking. So just be and then we'll have to have a conversation when that them. happens and change move it around. But so could we get consensus from you know us that I had an idea? Oh, Nicole, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that you know everybody keeps mentioning that all the other districts are doing this, and I actually listened to Placentia or Belinda's um, meeting last night, and they are one of the ones with time limit. And they read public comments for, or actually they had them coming to the podium for an hour and a half. So I just don't see, and, and we are in every other district. We do a lot of things different than most districts because we are a unique place and we are a, a small community. And I just personally, I don't know how I can look at the public when they are in here and say, you don't have a voice tonight, you don't have a voice tonight and you don't have a voice tonight that that is would be extremely difficult for me um, because I think every voice is important in our community. Um, so with regards to when we're back in person, I just I don't know how that looks. Um, we've always said we've wanted our community to chime in. So this seems like a way of saying we don't want to hear from you. And I know that was the message that was received in our last meeting. So I just um, I, I'm definitely open to suggestions um, with regards to uh, the last minute scramble for public comments. Um, I was not aware that it was an issue last year um, and I am all for scaling it back, but I do ask that we just give people through the lunch hour. Um, and, and I just, I don't think it's an unreasonable amount of time. Well, I, I agree with you with that, but to one point, but you realize that the person who has to handle this right now has to set up this room, set up the boardroom upstairs, set up everything else for us, get all the paperwork together, correlate everything for us in those last few hours, because you can't come down here at noon at your lunch hour and take over this place. So we have to, I have to think about everybody involved here, just not, you know, the person who wants to take the lunch and write a note. I think that um, we need to look at the bigger picture of things here. And that's this, we're just doing this for now until written in comments are done. And then we'll have another conversation about how we're going to handle it in person. But for now, um, I, I believe, and, and by the way, I want to add on that we're going to change the format in the sense that if Gail writes me a letter and it talks about this topic, it will go in that topic. I will read it during that topic because it almost seems like a waste to read her comment now. And then an hour and a half from now, get to that topic. Cause it, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate very well. It doesn't flow very easily either. So that's going to be one of the changes I hope you guys are okay with. I hope we can get consensus so, on that. So yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because it needs to be, it needs to be able, you need to be able to categorize it, you know, or, or put it with, you know, the same place. You can't just I say it. Have to be just because she has something that isn't until later on the agenda. And we have had people in the past who've jimmy rigged the agenda to put things in, in places that are either where they liked them. Uh, that's no one here in this room, but it has happened before. So I, I just I don't, wish you to be cognizant that this isn't just for yeah. us. This, so is, this is ongoing. In, in other board meetings, when they know that that's the process, because that is a typical process for council, for example, they don't come at 6.30 and stay till 10, they come when it's when it's closer to their time to speak on that agenda item. But That's they can normal... always speak in matters of the audience, matters to the audience. You but it's, not, speak but we, it's okay to do things differently. It's okay to do them. I mean, we are different, we're special. I get it, we all think we are. I'm sure their districts think they're special too. I just, I just wanna streamline this, I'm all for it. I'd like to recommend that we do the 20 minutes per topic and of course, board consensus, because I don't think for any reason we wouldn't, we would look at a person like Nicole said and say, you don't get to speak tonight. That's not, 
that's never the intention of anybody sitting here tonight. But if you have a rule that then you <laughs> make exceptions to, you're, you're violating your own policy. You, and who's going to make that decision on, on what night? When we had the gallery full and everyone had to speak about um, the, the name change, who would you have picked that didn't get to speak? We probably would have picked, we probably as a board would have consensus on how long this should go on and then said, okay, after one hour, we're cutting it. And we would have made that decision. I, and, and I just, I have visions of those nights and I, I think that would have been totally a wrong thing to do. So I'm, I'm really gonna just say that I'm against the whole thing at this point. So other than the efficiency for um, Annette to you know have a cutoff, I think that's reasonable. I think that's a good idea. So noon cutoff's okay with you? It's only probably going to be another week. Two. We're going to be in another board meeting before hopefully we have right. people. It's funny um, hearing Jim's comment. I haven't talked to Jim Bailey in a really long time, but I, I echo everything he said in that letter. So I just feel it sends the wrong message to our community when we so actively ask them to engage. So, you know, I have friends in education and they go to school board meetings and there are some people that have board meetings in one hour. And I just couldn't imagine that happening with that. I mean, they just don't have the uh, public comments. And I just, I want to give people a, a way to communicate. That's why I was saying with the tab and they can still communicate. And I mean, even now people can be emailing us and we don't get it, you know, not that we're the ones that want to get the emails because the district is the one that's doing the work, but I feel like we've given them avenues and, and not everybody comes here. Not everybody, you know, is going to do that. I did see an example on agendas. They put time frames, and it's just ideas. They didn't hold it to it, but just so that somebody gets the agenda, then they know, oh, okay, well, they're not going to probably talk to this until like maybe 8.30, you know, kind of gives the public an idea of, you know, a time frame that they can show up for their subject. That's just an idea. But if you give a time on your agenda that you're going to talk about something, and then if you're ahead of schedule, you got to wait to talk about it. We've run into that before. We're going to time the schedule, yeah. though, are we? I, I, I mean, if, I, if we have an agenda <laughs> item listed, we'll just put down, you know, the, I'll know that comes after these things and not right. to guesstimate the time, I guess. But if, if a mom comes in here, you know, a mom comes in here and says, I work, I'm at home all day with all these kids, and I wish one to come say something. Can I say something about this now? I think we have the I think we have the ability to say, yes, go ahead. You know, why don't you just, so you can go home with your kids. But you're setting up a system that doesn't make them feel comfortable to do that. If you're saying what you're doing is what, how you're gonna do it, you know that people fall into whatever your practice is. So instead of, I just don't think they're gonna be willing to make the effort at that point. It, it, becomes, it becomes sending a message that you're not interested in what they have to say. You know, I don't know. What do you how are you how do you feel? I mean, we're looking for consensus on doing a, a 20 or 20 a 20 or 30 minute. I limit. recommend 20. 20? 20 per topic. Um and I recommend notifying the public public. Notifying the public. Okay, let's do 30 because you guys were both asking for a longer amount of time, right? Absolutely. Let's do try 30 and we can adjust it to 20 if we need to. Definitely publicize it to do a, um, an email out to everybody, staff and families. Um, I don't know what other communication we have out there. Um, and maybe look at to the um, adding the tab to the website. I like that idea. Pardon? I like the tab on the website. Idea. Yeah, you should. Although okay. we do have our, our emails are on the website as well, right? They are on there. Yeah. I know not all the city ones aren't. Dr. So I, was, I know. Dr. Mason, did you get all that on so far? Okay. Moving on to the next part of it. Recog uh, Recognitions, I'm sorry, resolutions as recognitions. Go ahead. No, we'd like to go 30 minutes per topic um, and noon on the cutoff time. Like we have right now, except 30 minutes instead of 20. Although I would like to say if we do get to uh, in person and we do have find out we have the capability of doing some kind of zooming in, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, because that that noon time, that's going to go away probably. That'll so we may away. have to talk about how that works, that zooming part when we get there, yeah. and how we the cutoff for that. And maybe so, we could have Derek look into that for us just to get an idea of what it would take. 
So consensus for that item, he's seeing three. So he sees Carrie, Paul, and Dina have all agreed to that. Right. Pardon? No, no, we're just getting consensus on it. We just voted. Right. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, I wrote a list of things I wanted to talk to you guys about. Another one I want to bring forward is, is resolutions. Um, a majority of the time when I start looking at our resolutions that we do every month, a majority of these resolutions are done on the federal level, on the state level, and on the county level. And then we rewrite this for everybody else. Um, it's disingenuous for us to create a document that's been created three times and, and it's being just read the same time. So what that thought was, instead of doing a resolution for all these dates, my idea is to recognize these items and do something. Our actions are louder than a bunch of words written on a resolution. So do something. For example, if it's like, you know, um, cafeteria workers week, we already know there's a giant resolution coming down from the state and from the Senate, the assembly and everybody else. Why don't we do something nice for them and show them what they mean to us instead of filling out a, a resolution form, which is just a bunch of words. But I think doing that will not only reduce our resolutions that we write, um, it also be a little bit more of a personal touch to the employee, you know, to all the employees of the district. So I agree wholeheartedly. I don't, there's a bunch of words on a piece of paper. Sometimes we don't even read the resolution. People don't even know what we're saying within that resolution. So if we don't even have the time to take to read it and to express our thoughts to the group that we're, you know, expressing them to, uh, it's it's kind of a waste of time. I don't think they really appreciate that very much. So I would agree that if we could couple some things to do along with it to show our appreciation, that would be fabulous. And if we could do that together as a board, I think that would be awesome. Tina? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. What were your thoughts as far as cost? What is it a certificate? Is it picture taking for the public you know, to see? It could be for like, for example, law enforcement week. We always have a resolution for that. And we always do that for fire week and everything else. You know, we just go down as a board and we go take, take them a bunch of food and drop it off for them just to say thanks or a card or we have our kindergartners draw a card up for them or we can do all kinds of the, the sky's the limit we just need to know when they're coming so we can all collectively think about it for a second but some type of recognition i think would be physical recognition where we actually show up and, and talk to them and say thank you and it kind of goes back to that whole planning document at the beginning of the year you have to look at res what resolutions you want to pick out. And so you you purposely know with each meeting what you're gonna be doing so you can do some time and planning in that way. It's not, we always kind of are doing the catch up game. Right. So I think it needs to be done on an annual basis so that you know as a board what you're gonna be recognizing. Um, on that topic, on the Friday update, which will come out tomorrow, Annette's been working on that and highlighting on a tab on the board page showing the resolutions that we, typically do. And some of them are a resolution for the GAN limit and a resolution for, you know, the EPA and we spend the appropriate dollars on teacher salaries and so forth. So we're not talking about those kinds of things. We're really talking about the people driven resolutions. And if you go to the board link, 
it's embedded in her update um, tomorrow. You'll see something that she's working on that can maybe inform some of this discussion. And I don't, I don't know that decisions on what that, that takeaway or that tangible recognition is other than I'm hearing the board say, let's make it meaningful and purposeful. And, and folks have talked about that for, for a while. It's less about the words you read, more about the things you do. So take a look at that link tomorrow and it may, it may, may help guide some of your thoughts on how many resolutions we're really talking about that, that this would impact. So everyone okay with that? Love it. Okay. Um, one of the other things I saw this week, and I, sorry, I'm bringing these up, and if you guys have something you can add in, please do. But one of the other things I saw this week as I was reviewing our agenda packet, and I noticed our minutes were 20 pages long, the minutes that we approved or are going to approve. Um, and I, when I reviewed them, I found that numerous items that were A, not legally needed, and B, statutorily not supposed to be there. So Minutes are called minutes because they come from the Latin word minutos. Okay, it means small. It would not be, it would be, um, they need to record, they don't need to record all it said, they record what actions are by the board. For example, Education Code 35145 states that minutes record all actions taken by the board. Minutes are brief summary of the board's discussion. They shall not include a verbatim record of the board's discussion on each topic or the names of board members who've made specific points during the discussion. To be concise, Government Code 54952.6 states, action taken means a collective decision made by a majority of the members of a legislative body, a collective commitment or promise by a majority of the members of a legislative body to make a positive or negative decision, or an actual vote by a majority of the members of a legislative body when sitting as a body upon entering, upon a motion, proposal, resolution, order, et cetera. Basically, it shouldn't be a 20 page minutes program. Because that's there's a lot of stuff in there that has no no reason to even be in there and, and and statutorily shouldn't be there. So my thought is is for us to follow the ed code and the government code and try and do them as brief as possible. And the only reason I say that is because we re, we video record all of our meetings now. So the minutes don't have to be a verbatim thing like they used to be when I first started. We had a person who was a clerk reporter or a court reporter who would type every single word out. That's not even close to what the statutory requirements are. Um, so my thought is, is to go back to trying to make it a simpler process, go back to what we need to do, which is our action taken, and then uh, keep it exactly what statutory asks to be. Any comments, thoughts? Nobody. No, I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Mason, how long, I mean, I remember um, Yvonne with her little headphones on doing that, but how long, and I don't want to, I'm not going to corner you, don't worry. Um, does your executive assistant spend on on doing the minutes now, not before? I, I think that probably is unique to the meeting. If it's you know one of the midnight meetings that would have been referenced in 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 lots of agenda items and so forth, clearly longer, but um, hours a week to to prep them and um, yeah yeah and. Um, previous model was um, more of a, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I'd say court reporting, but very robust, but it was also back at a time when we were thinking that we were recording the meetings. And as we um, looked back and people wanted to know where they were, they were merely to, recorded to, to listen to on the little pedal wheel and, and, and then type. Um, I believe the board's commitment going forward is to continue to um, videotape and, and retain them, whether on our YouTube channel or, or attached to our agenda um, now that we're with, uh, with Gamut. Um, and so the, the need for, for, for minute by minute minutes is, is probably not the same as that it would have been in, in, the, in the past. I, I like streamlining, so I'm with you on that one. I never knew it was a problem. So, I mean, I just read the minutes and if there's changes, then I would make a comment, but I, I just never knew that was a problem before. So, I, and, and that's the thing for me is, is I wish we had been notified this was an issue so that, you know, we could have had some thoughtful conversation about it. Um, I guess my question to Dr. Mason would be, has, have you spoken to legal about 
you know, about this issue? Um, I, I haven't spoken with legal. It's, it's just in Brown Act or, or call to order books or, or whatever, where it's guidelines of what, what minutes are required. And it's really the primary function is to outline what's going to be done or covered at the meeting and then noting the actions taken by the board. Um, and then that needs to be turned in then for the business office because that substantiation needs to be there for whether it's paying bills or whatever. But um, the, the ability to re recount the, the meeting in, in the minutes of, of what all went on, that's really better done in, in a format now on a, on a video than in, in just minutes. I, I don't know that it was an issue before. It's just what was always done because there wasn't another platform. And I, I don't know that there's a problem. I'm going to assume that there's something you didn't know that I knew. I, I know we all received, um, remember that invitation to the, the new Brown Act? Did any of you right. attend yeah. it? And I they attended. covered the minutes in it? Right. And then it's also, it's actually from the call to order book. So I was playing in there, like I told you. And, um, and it caught my eye because I didn't know we had 20 pages either. I mean, I should know because we should all read our minutes. And when I went back in and looked, I thought, oh, it's verbatim and there's just a lot of time savers here that we could do for more efficiency for our staff as well as us and um I, we are on recording so i'm just looking like yeah. I'm, i just pulled up our minutes from rop main last night so i i because I, I don't even again i've never looked at like paid attention how many pages long our minutes are but just always from our on. you know we have a small meeting it's a very short meeting typically like three or four hours that's it um it's 15 pages. So that doesn't mean that they have to. That's what I'm saying. I think in that Brown Act, in that Brown Act thing, they said um, a brief summary of the board's discussion. They shall not include a verbatim record of the board's discussion on each agenda topic or the names of board members who, oh, there's more, uh, made specific points during the discussion. Just language of each motion. Yeah. Votes. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is supposed to be a brief summary of the meeting. There's, I, I think I agree with that. Um, I just saw 20 pages today went, or in fact this week and went, whoa, why is so much I, I stuff in there? Think, I don't think you can count on people watching a recording and going and finding whatever it is that they want. They should be able to, the minute should be a reflection of your meeting that guides somebody to whatever item they want further information on. Yeah. Is there any way to see a sample for the vision that you have versus what we have to be able to know the Formal difference? Or? Yeah, well, what other, you like visually it see it like. to do a side by side to see the difference. I'll find one this week and get it to you. Yeah, I think, I think I would just like to see a comparison. I can certainly locate, I mean, it's, it's the board doesn't need to do that. I, I mean, was just we, gonna we say, I don't know that this is even, this is a like. great streamlining thing. I love your cleanup idea, but, um, <laughs> but I, I would, that's between you. If you feel like, if you guys have a discussion, I feel if it's, since I just was re look, we were all just, you know, looking at the Brown Act and all the different things. If that's something else that you guys can streamline amongst yourselves with your staff, I'm all for that. Yeah, Support I, that. I'll defer to you guys. I don't think that's a vote amongst the board, no. uh, what the minutes would look like. Personally. I just want to make sure we're following the rules and staying within the guidelines set forth by the government code and the education code. Many times with rules, it's here's your obligation for the minimum requirement. You're welcome to do as much as you want. I think it would be just any efficiency is 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 more efficient. So anyway, I will we can we can look at models and I I, I would not start just doing something different without without board understanding or or approval. Um, but um, we can certainly take a look at that because. Um, something that's captured fully on video, then if Annette's spending time to, to recapture that in written form, um, it would exist then in two places. So- um, And the amount of money we spend on gamut and you're, you should be able to do minutes mm -hmm. while you're, like if someone's doing minutes, yeah. just recording, if that's all it and, is, well, then they're so, done when the night's over. Something else that she had done so people didn't have to fish because they can be unwieldy. If you click it on and it's three or three and a half hours and you have to go fishing for something, she's um, think trying to think through of also uh, making 
her own work more efficient, putting timestamps on that board item. So if you forward to third minute 37 and 37 minutes and 30 seconds, um, that would be just about enough for Rick's presentation, but you could go to the, you could go to that minute and then you could start You're picking next. up, you could pick nope. up the video at that particular time and, and take a look to, to assist the public that wanted to dive in and get to, whether it was public comments, a vote, an action item, whatever it may be, a presentation that was made a recognition. So, um, just looking at, for all of us, just, you know, what, what are ways to make things most efficient? I'll just, I have one other thing that, with all due respect, we've spent a lot of time here talking about these items. It would be really helpful if, if we could have them ahead of time, like funnel them through. If there's a, a recommendation that somebody wants to make or we're going to be talking about something, it would just be, I feel like some people came with ideas of what they wanted to discuss and some of us are being caught off guard with the discussion. So it would be helpful if you, you know, just gave us a little heads up about what it is that you're suggesting. So we didn't, we don't feel so in the dark. And I apologize. I was going through yeah, you know, all this week trying to figure out stuff and, and come up with ideas of how we can make things more streamlined. And I just feel like we're chasing this thing around the room, you know, so I don't well, know that we're making any headway. Well, we made headway on one of them so far. <laughs> the other ones are kind of up in the air, but I just think that we need to look at everything right now and try and streamline this as best we can. I don't think they're up in the air. I think we make things harder than they have to be. And I just, I appreciate you. But like I said, I'm a rule follower. So I totally appreciate the, the attempt at, at streamlining. And I, um, I don't know. I just think we can be more efficient. It makes me kind of excited about it. Kind of a little efficiency nerd. But <laughs> I know we talked about it since I started here in 2016. So it's always been a concept. Yeah. All right. Well, we will close that out and continue that later time and go to action items. Superintendent's department, 1A, board policies, administrative regulations, first reading. Do I have a motion? So moved. Ms. Lyons. I second, Miller. Miller. Do we have any questions, comments? Wait, this was. This is the. Uh... Yep, I did have one. So we went from, this is the first reading, correct? Yes. Um, we went from um, one year for permanent status or to pro from a probationary to six months. What was the reasoning on that? Sorry, who wants to answer it? <laughs> oh, who lost the flip of the coin? <laughs> lost the, yeah. Who lost the Rochambeau? And I'm sorry I didn't ask you earlier about this. I, I was... That's okay. Overlooked it. The reason for the change in board policy 4216 is because the education code was amended. So education code 45113 was amended to reduce the probationary um, uh, probationary period for classified employees from one year to six months at the expiration of the bargaining agreement with the classified unit. So when the bargaining uh, agreement expired this uh, past January, First, according to law, we had to reduce the probationary period for these employees. Okay. And so the board policy is bringing this into alignment with So that's law. not just in Brea for our policy, that's Correct. across the education. Correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? None. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. B, Board Policy Administrative Regulations, second reading for Board's Policy 4156, 4256.3, 4356.3, um, and Administrative Regulations. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Landers. And that was Nicole, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Passes 5 0. CSBA Delicate Assembly. Do I have a motion? So moved. Ms. Flanders. I second, Miller. Miller. Okay, this is our. Well, actually, I guess you can explain it probably better than I can, Carrie. Or, or... Oh, well, uh, as you notice, my name's on there. So these are the. Um, Nominees for the new delegate assembly for April 2021 through uh, April 2023. 
and it looks we were asked to pick nine and i love this is this what did you do i love this idea oh really easy <laughs> yeah this little like so why don't we just go if you have one give me one if you have eight is that what you get eight or nine if we get nine nine it, if you have nine give me nine i'll just check them off right here real quick okay so we'll start with nicole do you have uh, any yeah i would like uh carrie flanders okay as well as uh karen freeman okay is that it that's it thank you dina i want the um same two people um hang on on my notes um bonnie from huntington beach and jackie from anaheim and diane hill and i'll start with that okay yeah. Okay, I've got Michelle Barto, Bonnie Castry, Huntington Beach. Slow. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, next. Um, I just want to make sure I don't have too many. Um, where did I leave off? That's Bonnie on, Castry. On Bonnie. So Jackie Philbrook, Carrie Flanders, Carrie Freeman, Al Jabbar, Charlene Matoyer, and Susie Schwartz. Okay. Exactly nine. Well, she knew what we were allowed to do. I know. Okay. I, th I had, think I had eight. I have eight. eight. I have so. eight. One, two, oh. three, four, yep. five, six, seven. Yeah, eight, I think nine. I have eight. Yeah. Um, okay. Susie Arturo, you didn't take Arturo. I mistakenly gave Arturo a vote. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Eight. Okay. You want to do yours or mine? Uh, I'll do mine. They're pretty simple. Okay. Uh, Bonnie, Jackie, Carrie, and Al Jabbar. And Arturo. Oh, we're gonna have some ties here. First. Okay, maybe. Um, okay, Bonnie, Jackie, Carrie, Karen, Algebar, Charlene, and Susie. Four, five, six, seven. Um, yeah, I and just I mean for just for um it's hard to it's hard to not pick because it's really exciting for people that want to be on this but i know that centralia does not have one um and i know we were in that boat once and it was wonderful now that we have you know brea is involved um la salle has two already um two great ones not that diana isn't so i'm willing to put her on there too i just want you guys to be aware and um newport mesa the first one michelle she, they also already have one delegate. So um, I don't know if that matters. I don't know um, Arturo at all. So I have nothing to add. Looks like he's on the board 29 years. So uh, those are mine, my for sure's. And then I'm willing to wherever, you know, flex wherever you guys need to. I think we have I, nine different ones. I'm Do counting, we? I think I count 10. 10? Okay, that's what um, I thought. Oh, there's that one, sorry. I think, and, and two people have only one check mark. Yeah, and again, I could be wrong. So if you were scoring at home, let me know. But I show Michelle Barto with only one, and I show Arturo Montez with only one, and I show Michelle Barto, Bonnie Castry, Jackie Philbrick, Carrie Flanders, Karen Freeman, oh, and Diana Hill. Dinah Hill um, was only one. Dina recommended her. That's at six. Al Jabbar is seven. Charlene Montoya is eight. Arturo Montez is nine. And Susie Schwartz is 10. And we're allowed to have um, nine. So we have, again, Arturo Montez, who only has one. Um, Diane, Diana Hill, who only has one. And Michelle Barto, who only has one, if that helps you narrow it down at all have you worked or know of any of those people i i just will, i'll put a <laughs> i'll put a plug in for michelle i went through meg with her and oh. she's she's a fantastic i i think she's a new voice on their board and i i appreciate the what she brings i mean i'm willing to give up our tour for diana if that's a, if that's okay 
You, you mean Michelle, as she just said? It's no, no, we one. need no. If, if we keep Michelle and take her off the board, then the choice needs to be made between Arturo okay. or Diana Hill. And if you eliminate one of those two, you're done. You've got your nine. We just eliminate Arturo and we're done. Yes, I'll do that. Okay. I feel bad because he's, he, his school doesn't have a, have one a delegate at all. But, um, but I don't know him. He does so have 26 I, years though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm going to keep it mine, and you guys can haggle over the others. Okay. Are you removed, so, Paul? I'm you're the only with Michelle. Okay, Paul, you're the only one that are you with. If you withdraw Arturo, yes. we we have our slate of nine. Yes. Okay. Withdraw Arturo. Can you read them again to me? Yeah. They are. So, um, since it's your vote, I'm going to highlight the nine and I'm going to give it to um, a board member to read. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight, two. Oh, nine. And then this is due on oh, Monday. So great. So okay. you don't forget. these will be the nine. Um, if I make a mistake, tell me. Okay. Michelle Barto from Newport Mesa, Bonnie Castry, Huntington Beach, Jackie Philbeck, Anaheim, Carrie Flanders, Brea, Brea Linda, Karen Freeman, Placentia, Diana Hill, La Salle, Al Jabbar, Anaheim, Charlene Matoyer, Newport Mesa, and Susie Schwartz, Saddleback Valley. Those are the nine. Now we'll take a quick vote. All those in favor of these nine say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Okay, human resources. Um, number A, Braille and the Teachers Association Boda contract ratification. Do I have a motion? So moved. Ooh, ah. Wow, stereo. <laughs> Who's that? I'll do the second. Okay, <laughs> Lions and then. All right. Uh, any comments, questions? Nothing. I just want to say thank you to Brenda and Glenda Bartell and everybody involved in these excruciating hard negotiations easy because they all work together, which is great to see. So thank you, everybody involved. Mm -hmm. And with that, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Educational services, a up, update to district plan for providing educational services for expelled students. Do I have a motion? So moved. Lyons? Miller? Anybody have any questions or comments? I just want to say, great job. I mean, the specificity in here. We used to just have a boilerplate. <laughs> I mean, the things that are in here, I'm just... We should sell it to other schools. I'm blown away by. I mean, the example with the what was it? The social media. I mean, just all those steps for a kid to really be able to understand the impact of their actions. And I'm just thank you. Well, shout out to Janine Leach, our okay. administrative director of student services and special ed. So this is one of her tasks, and so she worked really hard on this. So thank you. It's uh, there's probably great stuff in here. We'll turn those kids around. Mm -hmm. Any more comments, suggestions? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes 5-0. B, grant sub-agreement with Rancho Santa Iago Community College District. Do I have a motion? So moved. Cool one. Alone? Second. Landers? Comments, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Passes 5-0. C, C, D, W, G, Samsung LED Pro TV wall mounts for Country Hills. Do I have a motion? Is that Miller? <laughs> Is that Miller? <laughs> and who's the second? But if it dies without a second. Flanders. I better, I better, yes, yeah, so better do it. <laughs> Any comments or questions? I do. Um, I just want to say that this will be finishing the entire campus with TVs donated by the PTA. Nice. Thank you, PTA. Mm -hmm. All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. No? 
No, that was perfect. No, I said, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed, none. Five zero passes. All right, D, Intellisys One phone system upgrade Country Hills. Do I have a motion? Miller? Second. One. <laughs> Questions, comments? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Measure passes five zero. E, award E rate bid to CDWG. Do I have a motion? So moved. Landers? <laughs> Lyons? Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Passes 5 0. Business services, lease agreement for Xerox machines. Do I have a motion? Miller? Second. Comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Passes 5 0. All right, now to the second interim. Do I have a motion? So moved. <laughs> Flanders. Second. second was Miller? Miller, or first. Just so we can comment about how long that presentation was. <laughs> oh, how, how great. Does anybody have any, it was a wonderful, colorful presentation. No, I love how you brought Christina and I love how you gave her that. Yeah, it was actually really cool. Chance, she did a great job. Yeah, she did. She did a great job. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Passes 5 0. All right, uh, we will begin. There's a board calendar real quick. We'll go over for a second. And we have a continuation of closed session upstairs after this is over. But before we do, um, we close the meeting sometimes in, in honor of people tonight. It's going to be in honor of Darren Sauer and Mr. Kenneth Reed. Dr. Mason, could you talk to that, please? Yes. Oh, board comments. comments. Oh, board comments. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't want to let you comment tonight. <laughs> go ahead. I missed that one. Uh, regarding PTA, we are still having elections at each of the uh, school sites. And once that is finished, we'll be able to continue with uh, council. And we do have a meeting the last Monday of this month for council. And we will be, um, you can get that link from your PTA president. And we do include Olinda for PTO too. And Gail, on your ROP stuff, just ballpark um, Grand Slam. Yeah, I, I, I want to sh give a shout out to Josh Porter. I had the opportunity to walk around on uh, Tuesday of this week, and it was great. Like everybody else, when you get on campus and kids are there, it's like, wow. Um, but I'm going to say when I walked into Mr. Miggs class, there was one student there in the back of the room. And so my heart sunk a little bit. And we talked to him at across the room for quite some time. And he you know, was talking about the things he's doing to engage kids and it's hard, you know, and uh, there was some kids on Zoom, but not a lot, but they were in the middle of a different project. And so, you know, the engagement in the classroom was good, but it was like, I just, you know, there was just one girl in the classroom and I, I was really like, oh, so um, to go the very next night and to see what's coming out of that classroom and it just blows you away, right? I mean, here we're giving kids a voice. They're using their creativity to address issues that we've said are important and with such power, a powerful message. I just thought they did such a great job. So um, yeah, how about that from going here to there? Um, it, 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 was, it was hard to see the, the classrooms very empty. Um, and I know that we've, you know, we're working towards all of those things, but um, we went into a lot of classrooms that only had four, maybe, you know, five kids. So I know that's difficult for the teacher. I think it's sometimes difficult for the students as well, because, and especially in that case, I mean, I told her, you, you're not passing notes in class, are you? I mean, this is ridiculous, but, um, you know, uh, so we're just all anxious for it to get back to, to normal, Any, anything close to normal. How about that? Um, a couple other things that are just fun things that, uh, are going on that kind of came, a couple of them came out of ROP, I guess last night, but we all get that leadership magazine. It's kind of the full color one you get on a quarterly basis. And, 
I don't know if you have a chance to read it, but if you get to your pile to read uh, the, the March, April issue on page 24, there's actually an article done by our ROP superintendent, Terry Giamarino about um, connecting students um, and STEM. And she talks about our partnership with ULP and all of the things that they're doing with those internships. So it's, it's kind of a neat thing when you see people that we know in uh, publication. And then uh, the other thing was, I don't know if anyone listens to Mike Matsudo, the superintendent from Anaheim does future talks. I don't know if you've ever listened to his, he's doing a podcast, right? You know, a bunch of them back to back. And he did interview Terry as well, um, again, about CTE. So just kind of interesting. And the topic was actually something like, um, what does the work first look like after the pandemic or some post pandemic? Um, so yeah, so those were fun things out of that world. Um, I guess there's, you know, we always are talking about study sessions and we want to have study sessions. So I would just like to throw out three ideas. And then if um, we could either revisit them or somehow decide if that's something you guys want to have a study session on. I've, I've mentioned the pension stabilization fund a couple of times. So I really would like to have us, you know, have some purposeful dialogue about that. Um, like I said, there's districts out there that have had it in place for, you know, now they're going on the two year mark and they've, you know, some of them already got a couple million dollars in their, you know, in their investment um, over their investment. So it's, um, it's just something when you think about how little we have to invest and the county is such a, a dog in terms of what we can gain from it. Um, but it is a trust. I mean, Rick's absolutely right. You can't just go pulling money out of it when, you know, with every whim that you have, but if you're looking long-term and we, you know, again, we've talked about hope and what all of that means. Um, I don't know. It just seems like we know that liabilities out there that we're going to have to pay. So, um, it might be a good vehicle for us to at least make it not hurt so much when we have to pay it out. Um, the other one is, I don't know if anyone else watched the redistricting webinar that CSBA did, but the, they are getting people, you know, ready because the census results are late. Um, I think it's September that they're going to be coming out. So all of the districts who are either going to trustee areas or who have gone and need to readjust their lines, it's going to be the timelines in there. Uh, you can go on the website. It's a, it's a slideshow that you can look at. But I thought it was, it was interesting information for sure. Um, it talked about gerrymanding um, districts and why you have to be careful with what, how you do it. And it was, it was interesting. Can I, can I ask one point of yeah. clarification? Meaning, yes, the census is coming and it's going to plot where people live in your city, which will change our trustee areas because it there's been, it could yeah. because there's been more development in some regions and not others. And it, right. it changes that. So would the study session be focused on the census and what does that mean? Or is it more that and I then the byproduct is, I, of how, what does this mean in our trustee areas? I think it'd have to be like, we're talking, if the, I, Forward the, it, it was supposed to be March, right? We were supposed to have the census results in March, but they've pushed it till <clears> September. <throat> mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think, I think it's, we're talking long-term. You would have sure. to have the results of the census <laughs> before you do that, but just something <clears throat> to put on the radar sure. that we need to start thinking yep. about. Hopefully we're doing our board calendar, you know, on an annual basis anyway. So just a placeholder maybe. Um, and then the last one was, I, I also tuned into the, there are things that the OCDD, uh, blah, 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 OCDE put out about uh, the seal of civic engagement. And I really would love for us to see if there's any way for us to do that program. Um, upon graduation, these kids then, if they start, if you started early, they've had civics basically through their whole career, but it's certainly something you can start at just the secondary level. And it ties in service projects and service learning. And uh, they get a seal just like by literacy on their diploma and, uh, you know, the whatever medal that they wear. And um, I just, you know, we always talk about it when we get to the election time that we want our young people to be more engaged in the process. And uh, this is real curriculum. Anaheim's done it already. Haven't they, is it like their second year, Carrie, do you know? I don't know exactly what year now, but yeah, they started. So, and there's quite a few districts that are doing it. I gotta tell you that one of the things I love too, and just sitting and listening to the webinar, it was like in the webinar there, 
getting the link for the Google Doc and then just watching the document populate all the districts that were in the, the they just all started saying what their districts did and by the end of like five minutes it's like a full-on document of what everybody's doing in every district I'm like that is so cool <laughs> i know you guys do it all the time i just hadn't had it happen so quite so quickly it was great so anyway that that would be my other thing i'd love to you know maybe see some and again nothing Right now, just uh, you know, in the future, I think it would be great. But I know there are several districts that are are going to do this that program for next year. So, but I know it's a lot of work. I'm not saying that we could even get there, but I'd love to hear more about it. Nicole, uh, Brea Education Foundation. Um, they've been meeting, and I know they have a meeting set up with you next week to talk about um, ways they can spend money. So we're super excited. They're still uh, working on ways to, to help the district out. Um, and then if you follow them on social media, they'll be announcing when the registration for the golf tournament opens up. So that is coming up next week, I believe, to register for the golf tournament. And then um, I, st I started doing the Go 365, <laughs> which... Boy, we got some people who have are stepping. <laughs> so I'd like to give a shout out to everybody that's doing Go 365. I think it's uh, been a, it was an, it's an interesting program. It's getting me motivated to get out and walk and move. And so uh, I hope everyone else will come join and do it. It's 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 a great program, and and you can see how active our employees are. So it was. I look forward to doing more of those programs. So. Um, not so about it. Thank you. I only have one thing to share. Um, I signed up for Legislative Action Week. I know Dina did also. So we have two meetings next week with uh, Assemblyman Phil Chin and Senator Josh Newman. Um, and so I need to pick some brains here of um, of cabinet before um, just to kind of get some some priorities that you think you'd want us to advocate for for Brea specifically. I know I did that before and um, I think Rick helped me a lot with the budget and we got to Phil and Phil Chin got directly to him. So I think we're looking forward to that. I'm speaking for Dina. She's so excited. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all for me. Okay. I actually have nothing tonight. So oh, no, well, thank you for voting for me. Thank you for voting for me yeah. <laughs> for the delegate assembly and that is in May. If I All right, anyhow, that's the calendar real quick, Brad, you want to point out? Um, I, I think just it, in recognition of, of one of the things you spoke about earlier about moving recognitions to our calendar and, and doing it during the recognition phase, you'll see the school library month is there on April 1st through April 30th. Um, we're finalizing some athletic calendars. And so um, we'll be um, happy to, to send that out. Um, Dr. Porter may have pushed that out to the board. If he is not, we can we can do that, link it. And it's, it's a work in progress. Yes, work in progress. Um, <clears throat> and then just uh, remind folks that uh, spring recess is, is the uh, um, April 5th through 9th. And uh, excuse me, we've got the end of the third quarter. We're coming up at the very, uh, very beginning of April. Um, and then a board study session on uh, March 25th that's on the calendar where we've talked about um, following up on our previous study session where we talked about um, facilities and, and really honing in on facilities and enrollment. And like I said earlier, I want to join in the memory of Darren Sauer and Mr. Kenneth Reed, but Brad, can you give us a little Yeah, bit? if I uh, could just uh, just share some, some information in regards to uh, both of these men. First, Darren Sauer um, passed away unexpectedly. He, uh, on Saturday, March 6, 2021, Darren has been with Brayland Unified School District and uh, managed the Brayland High School Theater for over 20 years. Uh, Darren loved bowling, loved King's hockey and the arts. And he was one of the biggest advocates for the arts and worked incredibly hard to make sure performing arts kids had opportunities to showcase their talents. And 
when you think about somebody that works in a facility like that, that has the entire choir, the entire, entire dance troupe, the entire um, band orchestra come through, it's, it's, it's literally, it, as well as all of the students that he worked directly with and the tech side of things and, and helped um, build interest and, and, and um, launch some kids that are working in the industry now. Um, thousands of students over the 20 years. And so um, he will be missed um, sorely. And um, we had some <coughs> counselors in place and, and, and people moved the, the, the most were um, actual classes in the afternoon that he, he helped teach and direct as uh, for the theater tech kids. So um, Tyrone will be, uh, will be sorely missed. And then second is Kenneth Reed or Ken Reed and Ken Todd and Brea at Mariposa Brea Junior High School, Brea Linda High School. And he was the principal at Olinda Laurel and Brea Junior High. And he was the principal at Brea Junior High when the class of 1986 entered. And when they left to go on to the high school, so did Ken. He loved the years he spent at Brea Linda High School, helping students in government, coaching golf, school, uh, soccer, and girls softball. And um, the district, is really made up of the people that, that work with our students and invest their lives. And both of these gentlemen did that very thing. Um, one lived to a, to a ripe old age and, and unfortunately another did not. And uh, both will be sorely missed. Thank you. And with that, I join this meeting upstairs. Good night. She didn't get it.